Hello and welcome to the Magic of podcast with Paul Rothman. And my very special guest today is the amazing R. Paul Wilson. He is a magician, uh, a uh, director, producer, writer, creator. He's a, a, a many, many things. I probably left out a whole bunch of things as well. Um, a con man or knows about the old con. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Yeah, I was I was waiting to see when we stopped and how far that could go. Yeah, I'm doing very well, and uh, hopefully you are too. I am. I am. I, okay, I'm just going to get one thing off the uh, off the table straight away. The R, the R. Paul Wilson. People ask me, is it R. Paul Wilson? I said it was Paul. I know him as Paul, but what's the R about? The uh, I've always been Paul Wilson, and I was named Paul as a baby. But I guess. Um, my father made the decision, as far as I'm aware, when he went to the registry office that um, his name is Ronald. And he thought Paul Ronald didn't sound as good as Ronald Paul. So he put Ronald Paul Wilson and they called me Paul. And what that meant was is that I was, you know, throughout my entire life having to explain, yes, I know that's my first name, but I use my middle name. And, um, you know, I went to the army and I had to explain that as well. And, of course, that ended up with all sorts of problems. And so it actually turned out to be quite useful in that there are several Paul Wilsons out there. Um, there's a Paul Wilson that writes about uh, um, football and sports, and there's a Paul Wilson who plays uh, in a band, um, Ski Patrol. There's uh, you know Paul Wilson who writes books on being calm, which is definitely not me. And uh, so the R. Paul Wilson, and F. Paul Wilson, of course, who's uh, an author that I really quite like, uh, wrote a great book called The Keep, which I remember reading a couple of times when I was a kid. And so R. Paul Wilson just was a, a handy way to um, be different to them in, in terms of like, you know, I'm obviously not that one, I'm that one. And it's just resulted in uh, I get called Paul, some friends call me R. Paul, some calls, friends call me P, some friends call me R.P. Um, I have a couple of friends that call me RPW, but they do it all the time, and it's a little bit annoying. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's really just a, a writing name and a, a name for you know the film stuff. So, so now everyone knows. Now we know. Okay. Uh, now, <laughs> so um, you've been well. You're I know you through originally probably the Magic Circle. Mm-hmm. Um, you. You're and I bump into you in the strangest of places as well. Um, we've we've like randomly bumped into each other in, in a magic shop at the Magic Apple in uh, Los Angeles and mm-hmm. at the castle and uh, all over the place actually. And so you're and and it's been I've been in London and then you've been in California as well and and you're in Scotland now and um, you move around. But what, you, where are you? Where where are you based these days? What's your uh... my uh, my secret lair? Mm. My secret, you know, James Bond uh, villain lair has always been in Scotland, and I um, I do travel a lot. I mean, I was born in Cyprus and I was raised in Singapore, and uh, I think that sort of you know I didn't travel much until uh, you know my early 20s, I started to travel a little bit just with things like a holiday to Spain. But, you know, when everyone else goes on a holiday to Spain, they kind of enjoy themselves. I was like hiring a motorcycle and, you know, exploring and trying to find magicians when I didn't know where to find them and all that kind of stuff. And it it really kind of opened um, the floodgates for me in terms of travel. And uh, so by my mid-20s, I had kind of... um, decided that one of the things I really wanted to do was to travel as much as possible and to see as much as I possibly could. Um, and luckily being a magician has really, really helped with that. That's uh, That's been the key that's kind of opened up the, the planet. Yeah, I was thinking about that myself the other day, just in terms of <coughs> during this strange time, um, how blessed and fortunate I am to be in this group of strange people Mm -hmm. Um, because the focus and the mental stimulation and the social stimulation that magic has brought 
and uh, and diversified in my creative outputs as well is is quite um, is quite stunning. Um, it's something that I've sort of been very conscious of, and it's something that I talk about or on the podcast as you know the the, the creative connections between um, different art forms and and what's going on in the world society and everything like that actually makes for the best magic and um mm. and the most interesting magicians i've met the most interest some of the most interesting people it's funny you know you, you with you as well it's it's i introduced you as a, a raft of different things there's a whole bunch of different connections and i don't think you'd be able to to pull one out from the other ultimately you you know being a a filmmaker specifically but was magic the spark? Was that the beginning area? Or was it film or was it something else? I think it all kind of happened at the same time. I, I, I remember um, it, all, it all happened when I, I came back to the UK. I, I remember little bits and pieces about being raised in, in Singapore, which is a thrilling and, you know, extremely, you know, interesting place for a kid, you know, a little blonde kid. And I I came back to Scotland with a, an English accent because, you know, RAF schools, everybody else was English and I had this English accent and um, that didn't go well. <laughs> so I, and I would spend almost every weekend I spent with my grandparents and I remember at their house seeing a Doug Henning special and there was somebody on there doing card tricks who turned out many years later, actually, I saw the same special a long time later, I mean, literally only within the last 10 years, I saw the special again, and it was Ricky Jay, which I kind of should have guessed. I didn't even think to look it up. I just, you know, I assumed maybe it was Doug Henning that did some card magic. But when I saw it, it was Ricky Jay, and I'd seen that around about the same time that I saw The Sting. And The Sting, which was on TV then, was part of my first you know, every Sunday afternoon, my, my, my grandparents would watch movies, black and white movies. And when I went to stay with them, I would go and stay with them on Friday nights. And every Friday night, there was there was a double bill of horror movies <laughs> on uh, on BBC Two. Now, this is in the, um, you know, late 70s, early 80s type period. And it was also on Saturday night, there was a double bill. And it was two black and whites, pretty much always two black and whites on Friday. There was a black and white and a color usually on the... Um, and I, so I, I grew up on all the old Universal horror movies, the RKO horror movies, um, movies like The Sting. And But The Sting obviously caught me with this thing with cards. And I used to play cards all the time with my grandparents. So I became fascinated at the same time. And then film didn't really, other than the fact that I really loved watching movies on TV, um, it wasn't, uh, it was Star Wars really, which was about the same time. You know, everything seems like it's stretched out for you in that uh, period. But, you know, Star Wars, I saw very, very late in its run, not when it just came out. It had been out for quite a long time. And I went to see Star It was an empty movie theatre. And... Um, I went to see Star Wars and it literally blew my mind. And it wasn't just the movie that blew my mind. It was the experience of going to the movies that blew my mind. And um, the next movie I saw was, it took a year, I think, before I saw another movie in the movie. I remember, I'm just a kid. And uh, that was Superman. And then I realized that if I, uh, when I was staying with my grandparents, if I was willing to walk for an hour, I could get to that movie theater. <laughs> And that's what I did. And so I used to go see films all the time. And um, right up until my, you know, my late teens, I would know the, the managers of these places because I was in so often. And I would come in and see the same films over and over again just to sort of look at them. And magic was happening during all of that. And um, so I was enjoying, you know, magic and learning magic and I was doing film but film was what I wanted to do. That was the thing that I thought I would love to do. And uh, unfortunately, at that time, there just wasn't the opportunities and I didn't have the backing to, you know, or, or the funds to, you know, go down south and find a film school. I actually tried to go to the Glasgow School of Art, which I did for about six months, and they had a 
you know, the courses that related to film that I would maybe get into, but the idea that I had to spend two years doing everything, just, I wasn't interested. I only wanted to do that. And what kind of happened, I think, is that I, my life got diverted. You know, I went and I was in the army for a while and uh, I ended up getting into, I was very good with computers and programming. So I ended up doing that for quite a long time. And uh, the, all of that was, you know, that's your life going in a different direction. But the fascination with film and reading every book about filmmaking and, you know, history of filmmakers and all of that stuff stayed with me. And the magic, obviously, I, you know, is, is a huge passion and I've been working on that my entire life. So in a way, the magic was kind of a, a, a way of taking that creative energy and, and putting it somewhere else. So that when the opportunity to do some film actually came up, um, I kind of grabbed it with, uh, you know, both hands, my feet and anything else I could wrap around it because really, um, I do, I do think that, you, you know, it's interesting. I think it's really interesting that if there's something that you really want to do, sometimes you do it and you find out you're not really very good at it, but you enjoy it more than anything else. And so, that kind of is the experience of everything. So I think, you know, everybody who's ever been great at anything has had to go through a period of suffering, <laughs> not being great at it in order to, you know, and it's harder to do that later in life because, you know, when I talk about the filmmaking stuff now, I talk about being a young filmmaker. I am a young filmmaker. You know, I, there are kids who are, you know, in their mid twenties um, or early twenties who are, more experienced than I am and you know they've they they come at it from different directions and they've got a different ideas and their ideas are however I come at it from an entirely different way and I've still got those same ideas from the, from those periods of my life to hopefully you know draw upon and but it is interesting being a young anything when you're you know middle aged and it takes a certain amount of humility to just deal with that and go with it and, you know, put your stuff out there. And it all comes from the fact that if I don't do it, I'm never going to do it. And um, all of that comes from the fact that it just struck me that magic and movies are exactly the same thing. And therefore, I do have something to bring to the table. And that's what I, and that, you know, so that's... Uh, very small potted history of all of that, hopefully. I mean, we covered it all. So we're taught what, well, you know, that is point of view. You're bringing point of view, mm. which is... Every, this, which everybody should. Yeah. E you know, everybody should. And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to have, it's actually hard to have a cohesive point of view because, <clears throat> especially today, there's a lot of knee-jerk reaction to everything that happens. So yeah. something happens and you're expected to have a crystallized point of view about something you know nothing about, which mm -hmm. makes, uh, I think it's a very modern conceit. This, this, it's, it's sadly not modern. I think, I think it's uh, actually, you know, it, it's a function of group think that the group does not think for itself. It, it follows a dialogue that has been pre-approved. I suppose the amplification is 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 this modern thing with the social media. You just hear it more. Yeah, and that might be a good thing that it can be released in those in those ways because you know, um, unfortunately, you know, this type of thing has has happened many times in history, and uh, and you know, to varying degrees, what social media has done, it has certainly facilitated a more global version of that, and and you know, spreading it. So it's not just happening in you know, in Germany, um, in, you know, the 1930s, it's happening globally. And although the, the topics have changed and the, you know, I keep hearing the term well-meaning about things that are really dehumanizing. I'm sorry, it's not well-meaning. It's, it's, it's all about control and uh, restricting people's ability to be wrong. Because, I, I mean, I'm happy to be wrong. Unfortunately, the permission to be wrong is, is being taken away and I think that's a human right that's going so that thing of having a point of view is actually these days quite dangerous you know and um, I'm willing to I'm willing to exercise it but I'm also going to be careful about it because at the end of the day uh, you know 
I, I'm not looking to harm anybody, including myself, but at the same time, real harm com- comes from within, I think. And I, I think that sometimes, uh, you know, that internal acceptance of external pressure can be extremely damaging to people. Um, even if they, you know, even if they go along with it, there's that little internal voice that's just not happy. And ultimately, every all of this stuff always crumbles. I mean, everything kind of comes back one way or the other. And I think that, um, you know, whether it's the kind of stories we tell, the kind of films that we make, the kind of um, magic we can and cannot do and what we can say and what we can't say and what we should say and what we shouldn't say, all of that should always be considered by the artists and the performers and they should be able to find out what's too much or what's wrong in order to do what's right because otherwise you end up in this very narrow sort of acceptable field of complete fucking boredom can we swear on this you can t- you can bleep that out fucking it's, can um, yeah but it's it's just it's, a, it's absolute fucking death in that middle ground it's, it's a minefield that you're invited to 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 stand in and you know that if you move you're going to blow up i'd rather you know i'd rather just try and find my way through it and you know not get myself or anybody else blown up and uh you know most of the time i'm just trying to you know live by the hippocratic oath you know first do no harm you know nobody deserves to be harmed for anybody's opinion or anybody's and yet I see people get away with it because they are on the right side of a trend, but that trend is very minimal and it's just loud and uh, well, uh, well documented and, uh, and moved around. But, you know, you've, you've just got to understand how to interpret what's going on in the world now. You can't just listen to what people say because even in the, with the best will in the world, the interpretation gets skewed so easily that you, you kind of lose focus and it becomes about something else, you know, with any topic. And film is that thing where, you know, I love watching films. I love watching anything that comes out. But my God, if, if somebody's just trying to, you know, do the latest superhero movie or do the latest um, coming of age movie, you know, just fitting that. It, it's like, unless you've got a really good story to tell, why does anybody care? And um, most of the time it's just, this is what the market demands and this is what people are being told that they want. And then along comes, you know, occasionally, along comes, you know, a really great little movie that will, you know, get me excited again. And, you know, hopefully one day it will be our turn. That's brought up a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of things mm-hmm. about the, um, the time to think and the time to debate and the time to have the conversation and the time to be wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as right, because everyone's so mm-hmm. self-righteous now that yeah. it's, um, you know, the people who go, you know, I've thought about it. I've actually, I've, I've, I've changed my position based on the conversation I had. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had that with Brexit, for example. When I first yeah. heard about it, I thought, wow, yeah, it sounds terrible, the uh, the EU. And then I changed my point of view on having discussions with people. Mm-hmm. And I went, mm-hmm. oh, well, actually, no, that, I, I, no, I understand your point. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yes, yeah. it's not 100% right here, and it's not 100% wrong here, and there are things that I should be changed, but that more stay in and more change those things or, or whatever. And that is consistent with what's going on, um, from my opinion, my perspective in the world. And, mm-hmm. you know, people might wonder that there's a lot of stuff to talk about here and, you know, the pol- the political side of things it reflects in our art and it reflects in our thought and 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 perhaps something we're trying to communicate or not or interact with an audience um, to create um, a, a bit of fire a bit of uh, a bit of tension and a bit of release mm-hmm. and a bit of play and sometimes it's nice to throw out the thing that puts people at in unease and disease and then yeah. they and then change the audience has no right to be comfortable yes you know um or you know 
the entitlement of audiences really, really pisses me off. Uh, you know, where they, they almost complain that it didn't go the way they expected. <laughs> and that that's like, okay, well, you're never going to like the next thing or the thing after that either. But there is a very sort of, yes, but, you know, I like these types of things and yours didn't go the way those types of things go. Or, you know, um, I, I've i always, it's it's like when you, when you perform and uh, somebody comes and gives you comments afterwards and you realize this person's never done a show in their life or <laughs> this person's done shows, but they're terrible. Or, you know, um, I remember... Notes is a really interesting thing as an actor, you know, where you ask for notes and you're careful about who you ask, right? You're always, it's, it's a, and, and giving notes is a, is a, is a responsibility. And I think that friends in the acting profession do that for each other quite effortlessly in terms of, okay, I'm going to, you know, because I saw you and because we are certain types of friends, obviously I'm going to give you notes. It's just kind of within the thing. In magic, that doesn't exist because every magician in the world is generally, um, you know, looking at it going, I could do that better or I know how to do that better. Whereas I find that um, certain actors, and I mean better ones, who've been trained well, do know how to give productive notes to one another. Um, Generally speaking, the, the person that won't do it is the person that you beat out for a role because that's not a good idea. Um, but, you know, I, I find that uh, notes are very interesting because then you get this other opinion coming at you. But it don't, it all comes down to who is giving them and did you ask for it and are they in a position to do it? And are you and available then, to take them? You know, because you yeah. can you can have the, the best notes in the world, but you also have to mm-hmm. you also have to want to take them and mm-hmm. to listen to them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. It's very, very hard. And and yet, you know, it's that thing of when people come to me with an opinion about what I should have done, that's not notes. Mm. That's not what that is. But it's very, very common and it's very common in all fields. You do something, somebody will come and tell you how you should have done it. And, you know, I just, it's baffling to me because most of the people haven't done anything, really. Um, you know, if I do a show and uh, I did a show at the castle a couple of years ago. And um, in fact, it was last year. It was uh, April last year in uh, 2019, which is about 10 years ago. <laughs> and after the show, I had Max Maven, John Lovick, um, I think David Regal. He's, I mean, who are all very good friends. And I know it sounds like name dropping. It doesn't sound like it to me because these are all very good friends. And I can't remember who the other person was. Um, somebody I'm not that friendly with, but who's also a very good performer. And I think John Carney was there as well. And they had all seen one of the shows that I just did. And it all had gone fine. And in the middle of the show, I was doing a trick that I'd never really done before that week um, consistently. And I was really finding my way. And it was one of those tricks that was everything that could go wrong was happening that week. And I mean, every single thing that you can think of that can go wrong on that trick was happening that week. So I'm now with these people and they're all talking about what they think. Adam Rubin was there as well, actually. And we're all talking about it. And, you know, all of these guys are way better performers. I'm not a professional performer. I perform when I can. And I've got this. And there was nothing, not a single bit of friction or defensiveness or, you know, it was just so creative because all of those people, to varying degrees, were just as vulnerable as I was. And there was, you know, everybody, everybody spoke from experience and from understanding. And yet I, I see the exact opposite of that in many, many other fields where the people that are telling you what you should do is based entirely on their personal agendas. And that's where you get, is what I was trying to get to really. That, that's where you get tripped up. And so, you know, to some extent, unless you have those people in the room, like those people, and I was lucky they were all there for one show. But unless you have those people in the room to, to trust, you, you're, you're really, you almost have to defend yourself and sort of shore up your defenses in order to go out and do it. And then, try and self-analyze and then hope that one day there'll be somebody in the room that can give you an opinion. Um, you know, when, when I was 
I think the first week I ever worked the parlor, so it was a long time ago. I'm not a stage magician. I'm very, very comfortable close up, but stage I have to really sort of rehearse it and know what I'm doing a little more. In terms, I can't just, I don't wing it when I'm in close up either. But I am, I can go anywhere in close up because I feel more. I have more tools in my Swiss Army knife. But in, when it comes to the the platform stuff, I've got you know two switches and that's it. One one, one broken pair of scissors. And when I I went out to do a show and uh, I had this piece that I designed based on, the, you know, the old bit where you show the audience the card and, you know, then you do a mind reading thing and the audience yells the card that the guy is the card that he's thinking of. right? Mm-hmm. And it's usually done with like an egg whisk or something. Well, I had be- gotten one of those head massagers, right? Because those head massagers just give me the willies. And so I, and I would always get a guy up because I, d- I didn't think it was appropriate with a girl. But I always get a guy up, and I always try and find a bald guy as well, because when you're bald, you won't know this, but when you're bald wow. and you put one of these things on, it really does, you know, gives you the tingles. And so you get that reaction as the crowd shouts the name of the car. That was the goal. And But there was a McCormical deck thing, which, you know, if you're not a magician, basically means that, you know, um, the the guy at some point, there's another guy involved, he gets the card wrong, apparently, but it turns out to be right. And uh, that element was in there. So there's a moment where I say, and what was your card? And he tells me it was the Ten of Spades. I don't, I'll never forget. And um, he says, Ten of Spades. And it's the wrong card. And the audience knows it's the wrong card because they saw the rest of the deck was all the three of hearts. You know, I showed them they're all three hearts. And somehow he's gone and thought of the Ten of Spades. This is the trick. And um, I... I can't remember what I did because I know what I do now. And it went fine. Audience laughed and went on and I did my routine. And It's quite dark in the in the parlour, or it was then. You couldn't really see the back room. And so everybody's filing out and you can sense... Have you worked the parlour? Have you ever done the parlour? No, just on the close-up room. Um, you can sense somebody has decided to stay in the room, whether they're waiting to shake your hand or whatever. But somebody had sat down in the front row and opened up. And very, very, very dear friend, um, but he's still Billy McComb. And Billy McComb was in the parlor when I first performed the version of the McCombical deck, which is his trick. And he immediately starts telling me how to improve it. So just, uh, minute, can you just describe Billy McComb and what he means so for Billy a lay McComb, audience? So um, he, he was a working entertainer around the, the UK. He certainly, you know, he, he's one of those performers that travelled around and was part of variety shows everywhere. And, you know, he would occasionally have one-man shows, but he was basically, you know, Ireland, Ireland's biggest leprechaun. Uh, a very, very funny, very dry um, performer who did really great comedy magic. Magic that is funny but is also amazing. And so, you know, it is the comedy is baked in, not just saying funny lines while doing magic. It's kind of everything together. And he moved to the United States um, at some point in his career and never lost that particular accent of his. And so he was kind of you know, one of the legends of, of comedy magic, but he was a he was a legendary figure who I had grown up, he was always at conventions in the UK, he always came over for those. So I'd grown up getting to know him and, and sort of seeing him and talking to him. And, you know, I bought his books, even though his books weren't anything that I thought I would be interested in, even though when I started doing the parlor, I went to his books for inspiration. And so a legend whose work can be found in the repertoires of many, many magicians who perform in front of audiences. And, he, and here he is. And he lived very close to the castle. He was there every night. He smoked in the castle, even though they banned smoking in California. He just sit and light up a pipe, didn't care. And I, I absolutely adored him. And we used to sit and talk all the time. And so he came to my first show, saw me do a version of his trick. And on Mondays, you quite often you would do the first show and then the last show, but not the two shows in between. I think there was maybe just one show in between just because of the way the crowds were on Mondays were quite light back then. And uh, 
I had that time to talk to him. And he told me how to get that laugh when the guy said the wrong card. He said, um, there's a secret to that. And I'll tell you what it is. And he told me what it is. And I, and he said, it's really, really difficult. But if you do it, it'll make all the difference. And sure enough, he was in the back row for the next show. And I got to that point and uh, I asked the guy, what was the name of the card? And he told me, and I did exactly what Billy said. And I literally felt like 20 minutes went past doing what he told me to do, waiting for that laugh, thinking it was never going to come. And when it came, it was a roar. I mean, I'm not a funny, I'm not a funny performer. I'm not a comedian at all. It was a roar, an absolute roar. And so he taught me how to do that, how to make that moment perfect. And it had nothing to do with card moves or slight hand or, you know, special tricks. It was just, what this was is it? what's happening in that moment. What hmm? was it? What was it? Do nothing. I ask him, what was your card? And he tells me the ten of spades when everybody knows it's supposed to be the three of hearts. And eventually they do. Eventually they start to go. Right. And at the moment that they go, I just look down at the cards, and that's all I did. That's all he told me to do. At the moment I heard the audience start to crack, look at the cards, and the whole place lost it. And what that meant was, is that when the revelation happened, when you know we found out I did have it, um, it was it was huge. It was really really huge, and I was um, very very. Uh, lucky to have that kind of contribution that kind of and and by the way not the first time it's happened at the castle i i did the bar you know ron wilson used to book me for lots and lots of shows he really kind of looked after me when i was living in la because i was sort of living on people's couches for a few years uh, every time i went to la just trying to get my agent and all that stuff and um he used to book me and he said can you do the uh the bar for us and i said well i'm not really a bar magician but i'll i'll do it and I spent, I came back to Glasgow. I worked in a place here in town for a couple of weeks. And I thought I was going to learn how to run a bar. But what I realized is they've got a bar back. I'll just concentrate on how to sort of free wheel at the bar, you know, see what happens and take it and then finish the show and then change the audience. And uh, I spoke to some friends. They told me what they would do. I designed the material around it. I went down to the bar. And rather than do my close up show behind the bar, which is what I think a lot of people do. I tried to do it the way a bartender would do it, you know, get the drinks flowing, have the bartender actually take care of all of that while I do tricks in between and then build up to a sequence that would bring the audience down and then get them out. And I had a great time. And the reason I had a great time is because after the very first show, Bob Sheets was standing at the back waiting to come and tell me, it's like, you know, you can't make this up. I mean, and I'm not a professional performer, but I do the parlor and, Billy McComb comes down and helps me on my first show. I do the bar and Bob Sheets, who, by the way, is who all the great bartender magicians in America really learned from because, you know, he, he came from Heber Haber Al. And, he, you know, he taught me how to loosen up. He taught me how to work the crowd a little bit better. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I did Svengali pitching and stuff for a long time. I used to travel up and down the country with a Svengali pitchman. And so I, I kind of was using that. And um, then uh, Bob taught me how to do the sugar trick, which is the greatest bar trick in the world ever. And I got I got to do that, but only for a few weeks because I'm not interested really in being a bar magician. However, because of the Magic Castle and because of the, you know, the, the multiple, you know, million threads of people's, you know, journeys that, that intersect there, I've been very, very fortunate, and, and um, you know, a close-up room. I've, I've had, you know, Larry Jennings. My first week at the close-up room, Larry Jennings sat in on almost every show that I did, and, uh, and then I went and stayed with him for a week. You know, <laughs> I've been very, very, very lucky, and I don't know why I've been so lucky, but you don't know at the time how special these things are. But uh, it all comes back down to I think the original point was. I've been lucky that the people who have given me advice in magic have really known their topic and have really helped me. And I've been smart enough, you know, most of the time to listen. That's fascinating. I, it's a, it's something that I've been very aware of 
um, I first went to the castle 2010, probably. Um, and then when I came back out here, I um, finally got booked there and, and and lived down the road from the castle. So it, it kind of... Uh, I was talking to Jeff Kaler about magic and about performing mm-hmm. there, and he was like, well, Paul, are you coming to the castle? And I was like, well... Um, uh, you know, uh, it's kids' week, and he's like, <laughs> "You should come down. Like, you can perform here." And my original thought was, "Yeah, but if I'm not getting paid, I'm a professional. Why can't I?" You know. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, "Don't be an idiot. You live down like ten minutes away from one of the most amazing clubs. Forget magic. Mm-hmm. Just as a club, as a venue, as a place, as a collection of people." It's insane. In the heart of Hollywood, mm-hmm. with everybody, I mean, just the people that you meet. And I'm a member, and I can just go and perform. I can mm-hmm. just do my shit. And I'm, you know, and I'm, you know, I have my sort of cockiness and my Britishness, and it goes down well. And I like teasing Americans, it's part of yeah. my shtick. And um, if they can take it. Yeah, I love it. I love, I love, I do a whole bit where, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm from London. It's in Europe. You need a passport <laughs> to get there. Don't worry. He explained what a passport is on the way out. And uh, usually they laugh, but occasionally you mm-hmm. get the one who goes, hey, buddy, I know what a passport, I know where Europe is. I know where London is. And you just go, yeah, well done. Anyway, mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, and... It- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, you know, I always used to make jokes about the great American traveler who's been to Venice and, and Paris and New York, and then he went to Bali's and then <laughs> finished the night off at Bellagio. You know, it's uh, the funny thing about you know the, the great thing about the castle as as a as a magician member is it is a great place to perform for an incredibly um, unpredictable group of people. I mean, it's it's it is genuinely one of those. I've never in any place in my life, and I live in Scotland, met so many weird, mental, brilliant, wonderful, nasty, horrible, great, funny, um, morose people in my life. It's, it's, the whole place is, is just unpredictable. Uh, you know, I remember when the, uh, you know, um, I think Veronin was performing there. He's, uh, I think he's from the Ukraine. But... Uh, for some reason, I guess because, you know, of all these connections. But the, all these people were there who were clearly like, um, they were Russians, but they were, I don't know if they were Russian mobsters or if they just decided to dress as Russian mobsters that night. I'm talking, you know, like long, walking around the club with full length leather jackets with gigantic collars. And um, it was really very, very strange. And you're just sitting there going, you don't see this anywhere else in the world. In so in so much of it happening at the same time. You know, I've been in there with, uh, you know, um, I remember sitting in, in Irma's room and uh, this group of dodgy people came in and they had all these girls with them and the girls all broke away to be in Irma's room. And back then, if Irma went away, you could do magic in there. So Irma is, um, for the uninitiated, a ghost who plays the piano by yeah, request. So the go- if, if the ghost leaves the room, because she takes a break every now and again, you can you could perform magic in there. So we had like, you know, 20 or 30 of, of, of these um, extremely pretty model-looking girls who were with these businessmen who were in town for two days. And they all broke off because the businessmen were having a meeting. And, uh, you know, I, I did some magic for them. And then this other chap came in and he did some magic. And then... Um, the bartender had a thing, you know, like a trick that was set up and everybody was just having the greatest time. And then of course the meeting ended and all the guys came back and they all sort of went off and the, the energy that had been created of people just having fun had shifted to whatever else was going on over there. You don't see that kind of, you know, I don't mix in those circles. I'm not, you know, but you got to, as a human watching place, it's absolutely phenomenal. And what that means is that when you're, um, when you're out in the rest of the world and you're meeting all the crazies who exist, you're like, yeah, you're pretty crazy, but you know, I, I lived at the Magic Castle for five years. And 
it's it's a phenomenal place for that. It's intense. It's crazy. It's um, one of the things I remember was that Aaron Fisher was uh, developing, a, I think, a college show. So he was going to do it, try and do a, the college tour, and so he would started working on stand up stuff. And I think long, not maybe not long before, but certainly before I even interested me. And uh, he came up with some pretty good material, um, including, but not limited to uh, drinking an entire you know giant bottle of Tabasco after making sure it was Tabasco, you know, because he could do that. And, uh, you know, crazy things like that. But he had some really strong magic in there too. And he would go down into the basement with a couple other guys and they would organize a little group show where they would all do one or two items each. And so, you know, people would go downstairs and they'd see, you know, Aaron Fisher and then um, I don't think Rob Zabrecki was one of them, but maybe I think Dave, um, who was with that group, he's... Um, uh, what's Dave's second name? I've got he's he's the drummer for the Pixies now, or he was then too. But you know, it's all these guys would be doing little shows, and and then there'd be a guy who's just a complete amateur next door doing a show, and then the guy after him would be like you know one of the greatest card magicians in the world maybe, or and it just had that amazing sort of you never knew what you were going to see, but those people who were coming, they didn't need to know who was who, they were just being exposed to great okay, sometimes bad magic, but it was always interesting and always, um, you know. I remember I hosted a show down there once. Uh, I, won't say, uh, I won't say who for, but uh, I was asked to basically host a show and introduce three acts. And again, I'm not an MC, but I thought, you know, I'll try and do a funny line. And I I had had a few drinks and I said, um, uh, I came out and I said, hello, everybody in they're all clapping and I said that I have some good news and some bad news and by the way Billy McComb was at the back of the room as well for this I said I have some good news and some bad news uh, the good news is I am not the performer you are here to see and they all clapped in cheer and said the bad news is is that in a couple of minutes you'll wish I was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and my friend who was on next didn't speak to me for six months <laughs> Just, he probably fell out with me completely uh, because it, uh, and it, it was that thing of you know, yeah. Some people just don't have the that British. Uh, I many many Americans do. By the way, I'm very good friends with Jason England, and he's as brutal as a friend as you could hope to have in terms of you know the things he'll say. But uh, it, that that friend wasn't on that. <laughs> yeah, we love a bit of banter, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. The more we love you, the worse it will be. Oh yeah, Jeff and I will. You know, I'll take the piss out of Jeff as soon as he's going up. I'll introduce him, and mm-hmm. you know, I'm just saying, well, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's part of it. And uh, you know, coming back to that thing about it's interesting the connection of the sort of people you meet and this idea, um, which I've heard a lot as well. You know that the the fakeness of Americans or the, 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 um, in the artistic fields, the bullshit level that you be fed and all of this, all of these things. And actually my experience is not like that at all. My mm. experience of being yeah. here, you know, I'll take the piss and I'll, uh, and, and there's a lot I don't like about American and Americans, but actually my experience of America and Americans is, I would say 95 plus positive percent positive, incredibly creative, um, the differences that I'm experiencing in my time here, and I think it's I think it's a mindset, and I think it's the energy you give off because I think it's 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 possible to go and have this other negative experience, and I think the positive experience comes from your mindset and what you put out and what you're willing to give and take, and the people I've met here when they say they're going to create something, they they do it, the british thing is to mm-hmm. to knock it and to find yep. the problem and the excuse and mm-hmm. and you know obviously i'm talking generalizations but you know i did a, a a sketch at groundlings here and out of that came uh, my friend wrote a short film sky mm-hmm. uh, wrote this short film with my friend brian who directed it it came out of nothing with no money but they made mm-hmm. it and then out of that we we just finished another short film which came with no money and <laughs> nothing. Yeah. And those things tend to happen here. And that's a big difference. That's something that I find very, 
uh, inspired. And the same with magic here as well. Um, although I'm, I, I, I still have my my magic group people who I speak to in the UK in the circle and those sort of things. But yeah, yeah. I, I find that you know I think I think America is so different to Britain, but you know I genuinely adore it. I, I genuinely adore that thing about. Uh, you know, you really can try anything. You do have permission to go and try anything and people will support you in a way that, I'm not saying they don't support you here, but the, the, the reason I didn't get into film when I was 16 years old is because when I said to a career counsellor uh, or a career, you know, one, one of those career advisor idiots, I, um, and I know there are good career advisors out there. I'm just saying this was not one of them. I said, I really want to be a filmmaker. And that's what, the way I put it. I put it 16 years old. I want to be a filmmaker, not a director, not a producer. I, I want to be a filmmaker. And uh, the next day I was called up to the upstairs office and they offered me um, I had to, this meeting with a counsellor because of my problems with life expectations. Now, that's genuinely um, didn't seem to... You know, it was upsetting at the time, but not in a way that I really knew how damaging that was. And they, you know, they were trying to help me. They were trying to tell me, you know, yeah, you need to work at McDonald's or whatever they were trying to tell me. I know that had somebody said, right, this is what you need to do. Okay. And you need, you know, I, I need to connect you with somebody. People come up to me now. If anybody says to me anything that I can help them with, I will connect them with somebody that I can help them with, uh, or I'll try to help them myself. And that's, because, and I think Britain's more like that now today than it was back in the late 80s, right? But I think in America, you know, even, you know, I mean, maybe not in certain parts, they're sort of so far away from the coasts or the, there are parts of America that are as, you know, um, narrowly focused as, as we could be. But generally speaking, you know, you will find somebody who will understand what wavelengths you're trying to tune into and try to help you get there. Um, and certainly I think that, you know, there are aspects I don't like. I hate the whole, you know, the New York thing. You know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Oh, fuck off New York. You know, I love New York. I love everything that comes out of it. But this sort of like, well, why why set yourself up as that? I like the LA thing of everybody's got an opportunity, but then I also don't like the the, the, the type of negative competitiveness that we find in LA as well it, and then and then london you know london's got things that are going for that are great the things that aren't good scotland is you know has got a thread of really great interesting people in film and uh and magic and you know equally it's got people that just want to tread water or do what's you know the, the bare minimum to make some crappy telly or some films that everybody's seen a hundred times before all of that exists out there but America generally, I find there's more available energy for you to tap into if you need it. Um, I do feel that. I, I think that, that that thing of you you can, I, I, the, the comedy thing, you know, if you listen to any of these comedy podcasts, the comedians are always talking about, you know, the life of a comedian on the road and the things they say to each other in the green room and the, you know, the the way they work hard on their stuff and, when we were doing our magic and we were interviewing and they were talking, you know, Matt King was talking about how comedians didn't like magicians because they all sort of did tricks out of a box and lines that came with the tricks. But many magicians are not doing that anymore. And, you know, Mac wasn't doing it then and neither were other guys. And eventually they built respect up when they realized that those guys are doing exactly what we're doing. They're refining, they're developing new stuff. They're doing that thing. And, the same is true for all these other fields from, you know, whether you're making film or you're being an actor or you're, um, you know, a variety performer or an acrobat, all these, all these fields have available communities that can help. They also have available communities that can hinder because of the competition thing. And I just think the helpfulness stuff is, there's a richer vein of that in America, in my opinion. I, lo I really love the country as a whole and i think in magic more so um well in my experience from the actor versus the magician and i think mm -hmm. my magic friends friends or colleagues are more likely to pass on work to help creatively to yeah. do funnel that sort of thing and i think the problem i think 
the acting thing perhaps is because just because of the way actors are treated and the the lifestyle that it 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 kind of forces upon people where you're really you know if you go for it maybe you're having to work as a waiter and you're having to do something else and you're having to do mm-hmm. this and and you know you have to build up this huge skin and you have to be you, you know you have to be tough and and I think that has a a bit of a dangerous of uh, impact on people and also the way that they i mean this kind of brings us on to a couple of things the uh we were talking about quality as well but the you know you you can come from anywhere and become a, an actor you can have no experience and you can come to LA and you can do a class mm-hmm. and you can hope to be spotted and there can be that moment um in the in my opinion in the the richer vein in in the ability to create good art or something interesting it's a continual study and i thought that was an interesting point where you said you're a young filmmaker um mm-hmm. which which implies that you are learning and you are taking on board your experiences and you are developing yeah um and i think this is where there's that really interesting um comparative between magic uh well ma- magic you you see these old boys in their 70s, 80s, 90s who are as sharp as a pin. Their, mm-hmm. their brains are on fire. They yeah. haven't dulled. And I think that's very specific to what the magic world allows to happen and allows the brain to fire up and, and, and mm-hmm. keep uh, relevant and keep young and stay young. Um, and And so when we talk about quality it brings us back to there's a couple of things this idea of the the social media magic the mm-hmm. the endless netflix content some of which would never get made uh, in the past but they're mm-hmm. definitely filling up space yeah you brought up growing up with specific films when you saw star wars the impact of that the impact of superman mm-hmm. um how do the how does the great powerful impactful art now get through the noise that is uh you know a million zillion people watch some social media magician with their setups yeah of nonsense Mm-hmm. Um, where is the Godfathers? Where are the Once Upon well, a Time God, in America's? You know, where, you know. Well, the Godfather was a was a was a film of its time for its time, and it, it, it endures. It can't it can't not endure. And it's an interesting thing that I think around about the there's there's a point where movies you know twenty year old movies when I was eight years old. Um, 20 year old movies were from the 50s you know, Rock Hudson and Doris Day and all that kind of stuff and you know, maybe 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or something was around them. but you know now old movies you know going back 30, 40 years are Star Wars which still holds up it still holds up it still looks great it still does what it did back then and so what I, I think is that the 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 longevity of movies in the seventies, like Jaws and Star Wars, and these are blockbusters, of course, but also, um, you know, smaller movies as well, like you know, the uh, the conversation, conversation is a phenomenal yeah. movie, right? Where it just requires a little bit more um, of a taste for cinema to to actually break through the the style and timing and tempo tempo basically of, of those types of movies compared to what you're seeing today that's super popular. You know, the people who love cinema and they only ever go see Marvel movies, they still love cinema. Their experience, however, and their taste is extremely limited. And I think that if you cultivate that, eventually they start to grow taste for other things. And, you know, people that genuinely would be bored to tears by The Exorcist, possibly the greatest movie ever made, 
um, or The Godfather, also possibly the greatest movie ever made. And, you know, those people may not have a taste for it when they're, you know, in their teens or even in their 20s. But at some point, once they've seen enough movies and, and, you know, cinema and film begins to speak to them with a greater... um, vocabulary and they start to have that vocabulary themselves they start to reach deeper into the form and then when they go backwards they start discovering these you know there's so many movies in the back catalog now which have been have never been surpassed and if you can get people to get away from what's coming next to starting to look backwards and by the way it's the same with magic you know I mean, you've got all these great books behind you and you know Everybody's still looking to see what's coming out next week, but behind us are all of these phenomenal um, effects. And, you know, I look and you can pick up any book back here, any book behind you and find a trick that, you know, anybody coming up with that today, it would be a single trick download that would be forgotten a week later because, you know, video downloads do not, you know, they're, they're, they're forgotten. Even if you buy it, they're forgotten within weeks. Yet when they're back there, they endure not just in paper, but, Somewhere in your memory, you have immediate access to that if you if you need it for something or if you just want to go, you know, treasure hunting. And I think it's the same with film, you know, when, especially with today when everybody's stuck home for so much longer and having to watch so much and with the, the available new material getting shorter and shorter uh, in terms of available, uh, what we have, then people are starting to get a taste for the stuff back there. And therefore, we will we are beginning to see much better films being made. I do think that we're still at a very, um, so much was innovated before us as filmmakers. It's very, very hard to be entirely original. Um, and even, the, you know, I think Denis Villeneuve is one of the great filmmakers of today. And, you know, you watch his work and it is very, very, there's a style there. Um, there's a way of speaking as a filmmaker that's just, you know, beautiful and direct and powerful and you can dig into it and see where his sources are and where he gets some of that from but there are other filmmakers you know and I can't name them simply because I don't care generally you watch what they're doing and it's just here's a lego brick from this movie and another lego brick from that movie and another one from that movie and maybe maybe because they haven't developed their own voice yet and that's very very common in any artistic field where you kind of base your art on what you like and eventually you begin to develop your own, you know, voice with that. And I be, I think we're going to see more of that. You know, I just saw a um, terrific movie, actually. I didn't think it was going to be as good. Um, the Invisible Man. Oh, I watched it the movie. other day, yeah. And I genuinely thought this is just going to be another one of those horror movies. And I do love horror. I love horror. But modern horror tends to bore me because it's just very cartoonish. And very sort of, you know, um, and there's a ghost and the ghost does this or the ghost is a nun or the ghost. And I, I know what those movies are for and they're great entertainment for the right crowds in the right places at the right times. It doesn't interest me as horror because for me, horror is the exorcist and Rosemary's baby. Whereas today that, you know, someone told me the other day, they said, you know, that stuff just doesn't cut it. I said, you know, it might not be as, it might not connect as easily, but the, the idea that it doesn't cut it when it is absolutely, you know, these these are masterpieces. And then, you know, I was talking about Citizen Kane the other day. You know, Citizen Kane is not a film I've ever truly enjoyed watching from, you know, the first minute to the last, which I've done several times. I generally get a lot more out of it by turning the sound off and watching pieces of it and taking notes and looking at what he did and how he did it. And, so, you know, it's very much like a movie that Spielberg made recently called The Post, which is a, it's a fine movie. It's not bad at all. But I, I watched it on a plane over somebody's shoulder, was watching it in front of me. And because I couldn't hear anything, I started to notice how he was moving the camera and, you know, how he was staging everything, which was both expedient for him in terms of time as a filmmaker. But the blocking, if you, you know, if you're into film, you want to learn how to block a movie, turn the sound off of The Post and just watch where he puts the camera and, um, you know, how each shot goes from one shot to another shot. When he moves the camera, it, it's he gets so many different setups from one camera move. 
that all feed into the story that, you know, as a new young filmmaker, you're just looking at it going, Christ, this is, you know, this is astonishing. But the post is never going to be, you know, packing out theatres like, you know, Captain Marvel. It's a better movie than Captain Marvel, but not if you're funding movies and, you know, putting millions of dollars into it. You know you're going to make a lot more money out of, you know, out of the superhero movie. We just need to find some space for everything because I think what's happened is blockbusters have shoved everything off to the side and, uh, you know, everything's $100 million and it's got to make a billion or it's not really a good movie. And some of that money that you're making just allow for movies that may not make more than their money back but will enrich the the available um, uh, catalogue of of storytelling and, you know, let have some lost leaders, you know, have some small movies and some medium price movies, medium budget movies have almost disappeared in the last 10 years. But the more of those that you've got, the more that you'll find the surprise, you know, hits of the future, uh, the Godfathers and, you know, other types of movies that will suddenly, um, you know, we'll all be talking about for you know for decades. I don't. There's not a lot of movies coming out now that I think will have the the same long term appeal as The Exorcist, The Godfather, or Rosemary's Baby, or you know things like that. The, that period though was so so um, amazing. It was so vibrant. Yeah. It was so colourful mm-hmm. in horror, in suspense, and drama, and comedy. And I mean, I, I watched the other night uh, for the umpteenth time uh, Hannah and Her Sisters, yeah. which is one of my favorite films. And mm-hmm. in fact, as a director, Woody Allen probably sits in my, my top directors because I can't think of a director who has so many films that I love. Yes. So many films that even if I think about, I start laughing or crying. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. if I think of Broadway Danny Rose, I probably start crying. Mm-hmm. Because it's so, mm-hmm. it's just so masterful in in so many ways, and it, Hannah and her sisters were what's so interesting about it. And I, I, anybody who hasn't seen it, you must see it. It hasn't dated. Mm-hmm. It's phenomenal. It's it, and what's fantastic about it is it's a film about storytelling. Yeah, it's a wonderful piece of storytelling. It understands story structure. Mm-hmm. In, in a cyclical sense, because it, it moves from Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving. And we see how the characters change, develop, or are impacted through those periods of time. Yeah. But we also, and it's something that you were saying, it's we also have incredible photography, incredible mm-hmm. imagery. We have incredible music. So I was... You know, hearing hearing it, hearing that film, it wasn't just seeing that film. I heard that film. Yeah. And the soundtrack to that film made me go out and listen to jazz, made me go out and listen to classical music, made me reframe those things that maybe I didn't know or wasn't interested in. Or And there's a scene in it, as, I mean, the acting, oh my goodness, in terms of uh, women in film... <laughs> Diane Weist, Barbara Hershey, Mia Farrow. Mm-hmm. There's a scene in it where they're in the uh, in, about to have dinner for Thanksgiving, and they're just talking to each other. It's just incredible the realism of it, the mm-hmm. interaction, the listening. That it, it's just it, I was just exploding with excitement. But there's another scene where there's an architect who takes a uh, Carrie Fisher's in it as well. Carrie yeah. Fisher. Um, and Diane Weist in a car, and he's an architect, and he's describing his buildings. And then he says, "Let's, let's. Would you like to see some of my favorite buildings?" And they say, "Oh yeah, yeah." And there's a scene where they drive around town and they show amazing buildings in New York, and you're the viewer looking at amazing buildings of New York. That's it. Yeah. So, how rich, how wonderful that that film is not just about the story. It, the, the great thing about Woody Allen is that, uh, you know, this is from reading um, about you know him as a filmmaker, is that you know he writes his he writes his screenplay and you know they they get to the set and he always says that you know 
it's just a suggestion. <laughs> so the actors can work with it. And not every actor has got something to add to that other than their performance or what they or their interpretation or you know whatever but the idea that you know we this is our starting point and together we're going to find you know where it goes from there is very different to some directors you know i mean i've i've got a particular way of working that's i think a little bit inspired by the Woody allen thing i mean i i, I don't you know i i think that uh you don't want to be changing a word of Quentin Tarantino's dialogue, right? You just don't want to be doing that because how could you? Whereas, um, you know, what Woody Allen is, is, is brilliant at is, is creating these stories and situations and, you know, these scenes where the actors can bring the scene to life in many different ways. And I, I think that kind of, um, collaboration is really rich in some of his films and in some of the films it's, it, you know, they don't work quite as well for me, you know, match point. I don't ever need to see match point again. I, and some people love that film. Uh, Vicky, uh, Christina Barcelona is a fantastic movie that I just did not think I was going to like. I just thought it was, uh, I, I found myself caught up in it and just could not get away from that film. It's an unusual not the type one, of film. Actually. Yeah. But not the type of film I would, I would really race to see. And, and I have to say Midnight in Paris is one of my absolute favorites because it's just him at his most entertaining, really, you know. And whimsical, I think, as well. Yeah, uh, you know, but it's such a such an enjoyable piece of um, entertainment um, that it, it, that film as a piece of entertainment, I think, shows you the the way that he has evolved from things like take the money and run, which wasn't just pure entertainment, but it was very, very funny. And, you know, obviously things like sleeper were, you know, but now when he's purely entertainment, it's kind of with this wonderful sense of, you know, playful meaning and pathos. And I, I love, I love midnight in Paris because again, didn't particularly think it was going to be for me. And then I just thought, wow, I mean, I, I could watch, and I do watch that at least once a year. I think it's a great <laughs> film. Hannah and her sisters, I don't think I've seen for about five years. So I'll probably be watching that in the next couple of days again. And Michael Caine, of course, is sublime in that movie. Um, Radio Days. I, I, Radio Days oh, is, Radio Days. I mean, Broadway Danny Rose, yeah. but Radio Days, vignette, little yeah. vignette stories that are tied together with a, a biographical journey. Mm. That mm. we hear a, narr- a narrator, Woody, taking yeah. us on this journey. But wow! And again, a brilliant, music, brilliant movie, and music. Yes. Yeah, music and 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 history. You know, um, I mean, Zelig was another movie that Zelig. I actually really enjoyed. And but you know, Woody Allen is one of the greatest filmmakers in history because he has done so much so well. Some films are not great. Um, some films are better than others. Of course they are. Nobody hits home runs. But virtually a film a year. But a film a year, at, and also a film a year on his own terms, which is, you know, astonishing. By making it cheaply, you know, I mean, a lot of these actors are not taking what they normally get from their, their, their big budget roles, which is great because, I, again, kind of like the the studios should be putting some money into smaller movies, um, says a low-budget filmmaker um, available. Um, but in the same way that they should be doing that, big actors, and many of them do, you know, who, who command millions and millions of dollars, and rightfully so because, the, you know, their face delivers those millions of dollars to the movie. But when the Scarlett Johansons of the world also go out and make these nice little movies that are just dramas or not big blockbusters, but are really, you know, um, it's really great for the business when they do that because it really um, create what it does is, you know, for every, you know, um, every, uh, you know, lost in translation that comes out, although that was a kind of hyper successful one. It Jojo stimulates. Rabbit as well. Jojo Rabbit was uh... a Jojo Rabbit. But what happens is these smaller movies stimulate other smaller movies that don't necessarily have big stars, but they have good talents who are, you know, they might break through because of that movie, but more importantly, they get to tell their story. And, and I think that that's the thing about, you know, sh- 
sharing downwards that has to happen more. And one element of that sharing downwards, although of course we're talking about Woody Allen movies, is that you get these very um, successful actors who would work on these tiny little movies for much smaller budgets in order in order to just tell that story because they're committed to it or they want to work with Woody Allen or whatever it is. We just need more of that. And yes, I'm all for Marvel and Star Wars and all that if it's good, but you know, you know, you you, you can't just keep serving, um, you know, ice cream <laughs> to people. You need to serve up some vegetables every now and again, or something weird that they never tasted. Yeah, that that sounds good. like the segue for speaking of vegetables. Uh, but no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could go anywhere. I <laughs> could go anywhere. I won't. Um, and and interesting enough, behind you there, there's an open book of Kubrick. I notice sitting there. Yes, uh, it's a, a book on Kubrick's um, time as a photographer for Life Magazine. All oh, right, and uh, it's a terrific book. Actually, I got that for my birthday this year. And uh, you know, these books are so huge that I have to have one of these Tasham stands, right? To uh, you know, and I, I read them, uh, you know, every now and again, turn the pages. Uh, but uh, that, that's an astonishing book, just as I, as a photographer, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we know he became Stanley Kubrick, the great filmmaker, but his eye as a photographer, just this, this ability to tell a story in a still astonishing book. So you, wh- what's the first film that you made? Um, I made a bunch of little things, um, some half finished, some some finished with vi- video cameras and stuff over the last, you know, as soon as I got a hold of a video camera, I made little things and, you know, it's the simplest things, but uh, nothing that I would ever want to show anybody, really. I Just playing around, you know, the Buck Twins and I made a, a piece of a, a film that had some really cool ideas in it just to play around um, when they were at film school and... Uh, I just was always trying to find that way of getting to a position where I could learn how to tell stories with a camera. And I, obviously you can read all the books in the world. You have to get a practical, you know, sense of it. And I, um, I, when we were doing, I think the last real hustle that we did and then the last series of the magicians I did with the BBC, I, I, got in touch with a guy who did these DVDs that I had bought. And uh, what he'd done is he'd animated almost every feasible form of blocking with a camera. And he'd done it all in sort of 3D animation, narrated by, um, I can't remember, it wasn't by him, although it should have been. And I'd watched them all and I'd sort of studied them. And um, he then brought out a series on, on visual effects, green screen type stuff. And I bought those and I was looking at those. The one thing I got about this guy was that he was a bit, I'm not anal, anal's not the word, he's just incredibly, you know, he could drill down into the, the, the very fibre of how and why to do something in that field. And I really liked that uh, microanalysis that he had. And I, I guess because I was on his website, he said he was doing a couple of um, workshops on VFX and on camera blocking. And uh, one of them would be in, in L.A. And the, the other one would be in... I, he was doing two in L.A. and two in New York. And I remember this was a January and I called him up and I, I booked to be in the, the, the blocking for directors um, week. And then the VFX one I, I was going to do in New York instead of LA. So I didn't want to do them back to back because I felt that I would just get too much information. So I did one and I flew to New York and I went and did that with them in New York. And at both of those, I met a lot of really interesting people because at both of them, there were, you know, this was not wanna be it was not a cheap thing. It wasn't terribly expensive, but it wasn't terribly cheap either. But this weekend, a lot of guys that were working at DreamWorks, a couple of them were directing movies that came out looking to see how the camera should move because they can move it anywhere and by moving it anywhere you can break the visual relationship with the audience in terms of a storytelling and uh so some of those guys were there just looking to to learn a little bit more about staging a couple of them were you know filmmakers like myself just trying just getting in 
I remember they, they were showing us a piece of previs from a Indiana Jones movie, The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which does not really count as an Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> but the, or the, a movie, the, really. Doesn't they, had the, they had the previs of that opening scene in the warehouse, and then they showed you that it was pretty much exactly the same. And that's kind of what was wrong with it, is that, you know, the pre-visualization artist in the computer had done moves that kind of broke the, the limitations of camera movement and they they actually made those things happen with the CG effects. And so he was talking about it and he was just using it as an example. And the guy sitting beside me at, at the top of the previs was the name of the animator. It's like It was Clint Reagan, I think was the name, Clint Reagan. And the guy sitting beside me said, that's me. <laughs> it turned out that that guy was right beside me. And I got to meet him and I got to work with these guys and we staged a bunch of scenes together and start to understand how to move. And I'm very into subtle. I don't like throwing the camera around. It's not that, it's not my style unless it's necessary. And I really understood a great deal more coming out of that. Then I went into the VFX course with them. And then I did it again a couple of times, but you know, almost as a, as an alumni helping them out to, to do the course. And I was uh, sitting on a plane and thought, all right, I think I just better make something. I don't know what it is. And that was the magic box. And I, I just had this little story I wanted to tell, which is based on, some of it is based on reality. It's sort of all kind of changed and contained in a different story. But I wanted to tell that story and I wanted to do it without any dialogue. That was the challenge I set myself. And it also made it easy for sound reasons. And um, we released that, did very, very well. And uh, and then um, I was talking about doing another short and buying a camera at Sammy's in LA. And I realized that the money I was about to pay for this camera, I could probably make a movie for that. And so I didn't buy the camera and I made Con Men instead. And uh, although I call it a zero budget feature, really, you know, I probably spent about $5,000 on it. Um, almost all of that went to catering and petrol and, you know, consumables. Nobody got paid on that. I didn't get paid on that. Nobody's made any money from Conman. But we were able to make a feature film with nothing but, uh, you know, a Canon 5D and um, a group of guys who all worked in the business but wanted to do something different in Scotland. And um, and so that's what happened. So, so really, I would say, although Magic Box was, you know, a nice little short, I'm really proud of that for what I wanted to do. Um, Conman was where I got to actually you know, do some filmmaking and, and learn some real lessons. Um, I came and saw your film uh, Isolani. Mm-hmm. In it was actually, I, I've got a funny feeling I saw it a couple of times. Did I see it a couple of times? I saw it at the Empire, mm-hmm. uh, Leicester, Leicester Square. Square. That was great, and that was an exciting time. It was exciting. I was that was my second feature, and was made. Uh, um, for again, very low budget, um, about ten times as much, really. So not very much at all. But uh, we made it in eighteen days. But uh, you know, um, we, despite all the limitations, you know, we I think we we managed to make uh, a movie that we're all, you know, we're all pretty happy with. I mean, I can never be happy with anything that I've made because I always look at it and say, why didn't I do that? And then I remember, oh yeah, you had no money and you had no time, and you know, you were filming in a flat between two other flats and the, the neighbours were complaining and all the things that we were doing. But Isolani um, sort of came out of the gate, was, you know, did really well in the festivals, got nominated for a lot of really good awards, won a few awards. Um, I think we're the only Scottish movie to ever be nominated at Camry Image, which is a sort of cinematography award um, that's kind of like the Oscars for cinematographers. But we were nominated for Best Debut and uh, nominated for a Biffa, um, and all these things were great. And then it sort of went out into the world. And it's just been a bit of a tough ride for Isolani only because it doesn't have any stars in it. It's not a genre movie. It's not full of violence. It's a, you know, it's a drama that uh, I think um, tells a story that I wanted to tell. And again, there's, it's actually partly based, not on the murder, but, you know, other elements of the characters are based on real people. And uh, 
I, uh, you know, got very, very lucky in that we, you know, we, we found a bunch of small investors and nobody was going to lose a lot of money on this movie. And, you know, we put, you know, I put money in and, you know, I think we made a, we made a movie. I, I, I like Isolani. I'm very, I'm very proud of it, but, uh, it's, um, I think watched it again recently, just, um, sitting going through it and you, you look at it and think, I used to look at, there was a period where you looked at it and go, why didn't I do that? I should have done this. I should have cut there. I should have done this. Whereas now I look at it and go, how the hell did we do this in 18 days? I don't know anymore. I, you know, I've, it's like, I've lost that skill set. you know, but it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy how much we accomplished in, in the days that we had. And it, the funny thing is, is that had we had a studio or access to a studio, we would have been able to do a lot more. Um, but instead we kind of had to go into this apartment and then redress the entire apartment. And we had to ask this lady downstairs to take our hearing aid out at night so that we could continue filming. And we had to tell the neighbors that we would be uh, outside stabbing people and all sorts of stuff, because, you know, it's Glasgow that could really happen. And it was, you know, we were eating at a, uh, one of our backers, you know, had a restaurant and we would go and eat at his restaurant at night, you know, and his, his, his staff would stay on to feed us so we could all go back and shoot into the wee small hours and all these things that, you know, if you've got what we call a proper budget, you know, with, you know, vans and trailers and all and catering and all these types of things, we, we did have catering for some weeks. When you have all of that, you can't accomplish so much so quickly because you don't have the, um, you don't have the mindset. So Isolani was, uh, kind of taking the lessons from con men and from some other things that I did and then injecting them into that. And then, you know, the, the lessons from Isolani will inject into the next one. And it's that thing about being a young filmmaker. These are the films I, I, I learned from. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just hope there's a, there's a market out there for more thoughtful movies because that those are the ones that really interest me. But those films, uh, you know, are they going to get into cinemas now or is it going to just be an online Amazon, Netflix? I don't think um, they are, is is the answer to that. I think there, there will be, in the next 10 years, um, more and more small movie theatres for people to watch small movies. And the bigger movie theatres will be for the big splashy movies if you want to go see it in the cinema. But I think day and date will stay. You will be able to watch it online, spend the money and stay at home if you want to. And so home theatres will become more of a thing um, than, than they are now. Uh, you know, I thought the the video of um, Tom Cruise and, and uh, Christopher McQuarrie talking about, you know, what you should do with your TV to avoid that, that soap opera effect. That was a step forward. And, and I really don't know why. Maybe they will, you know, because I know they're going to watch this. You know, Netflix and Amazon are all going to be watching this tomorrow. And But they should have that little thing that's always at the top somewhere of how to set up your TV mm. or, you know, or how to make sure that you have the best experience with our streaming service and why. And it should be hosted by Tom Cruise or, you know, um, uh, you know, anybody really. I mean, nowadays you can have it hosted by Humphrey Bogart because, you know, it's possible. But you can absolutely have somebody say, listen, we're making these films for you. If you really want to enjoy them, switch off the lights, mm -hmm. switch off your phone, and then you will have a better time. And e you could even put that at the beginning of some movies. If if someone buys, I mean, there's fantasy dream stuff, right? But if somebody buys the new Bond movie and puts it onto a streaming service, which is increasingly likely at the moment, why not? The first 30 seconds have Daniel Craig saying, we hope you enjoy the movie. We'd love it if you switched off the lights, put your phone down. And, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of TV you got or how big it is. If all the lights are out, the illusion of cinema, which is why coming back to magic being the same as, as movies, cinema is an illusion where you are focused on a single point of light. Like with a magic effect, we focus you on the on the conditions of the effect so that you understand the impossible and you you get lost in it if you do it right. You sit. That's why I hate movie theaters that are so overlit. You know, you can see it. You could read a book in some movie theaters, but when it's dark and you have that single point of light, you can do that better at home than you can do it in a movie theater because they have to have those exit signs. They have to light 
and of course they do because it's safety. But you can switch off all the lights, and even if you've got a small TV, the size of the TV or the, the position you are where you're watching it, none of that matters when the illusion starts to work on you and you become consumed by the story. That's what cinema is. That's what story is. That's what's great about cinema. And it, I actually genuinely believe somebody's going to figure out the home experience can be much closer to the intended experience if we can convince the audience to put down the distractions. I think they've um, they do it in the cinema anyway. They you know they put those little adverts on saying, "Please turn off your phones." The best way to enjoy this film is like this. This mm-hmm. is a Dolby. This is in Dolby. Uh, you know whatever system they've yeah. got, um, yeah. and and they and and you know mm-hmm. and hi, uh, you know don't record and don't do this and put your phone down yeah. and turn it. So those things are. are do you? I mean, I think I think part of the the downward spiral of, of movie theatres is their own fault as well um, because they have mm. made the cinema going experience and that this is not over this is not everywhere but they have certainly made the cinema going experience a, a, an unpleasant one that people sit there with their phones the cost of confectionery the shit they sell um, the, the stuff they sell is how they make the money because it's a broken model you know, and therefore they have to prioritize that. And I get it. That's your business. But really by um, essentially hobbling the experience of cinema in order to make those things more available to the people you want to sell to, uh, that's kind of led to this feeling that people who really get a taste for movies, you know, nothing it will annoy you more than somebody interrupting that concentration you have. And the, the fact is, is that, you know, you know, it's an old man thing, isn't it? But, you know, generationally people don't seem to think there's anything wrong with taking your phone out in the middle of a movie theater. I was, I, I've, I've actually been in a movie theater where somebody was Skyping with somebody, you know? Um, and I guess that, you know, is that going to change? Is that, or is it just the way it is going to be now? I, I genuinely think it isn't because I think the smarter people are, the less likely they are to do that. And I know that sounds like, you know, grumpy old man, but genuinely it's, it's a lack of intelligence just feeding off of the, you know, the being a slave to this object that we all, but it's a tolerance, it's a tolerance, it's a tolerance, you know, it's uh, in, Mm -hmm. you know, theaters, they don't allow that, but people do it and they get stopped. And, you know, if I go to the Arclight here, it's a yeah, wonderful, it's yeah, a wonderful cinema going experience. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful. They don't every let man people is the in. Same here. The, yeah. you know? Every man is the same here. Have you been to an everyman cinema? Not for a long time. But, you know, they have these small, like, couch, you know, very small cinemas with couches and stuff. And, you know, like at the Arclight, they get up and introduce the movie. Yeah, there's something different about it, just That's the fact they do that. Right. And they say, they say, please do not use your phone. We will ask you to leave. Right? They say that. And then I went to see Alien and the uh, 40-year anniversary. And as the girl was leaving, who had just done the, the thing, you know, somebody still had their phone out. And she leaned over and she said, no, you need to put that away. And they put it away. And then that was the end of that. And that was great. And I just thought, you know, yes, that's what it should be. It should, you know, they can see if you light up a phone, if they're watching, and they can see where you're sitting. And they can, and I think, you know, they should, pause the movie. <laughs> Come and get you and give you the walk of shame, right? Absolutely, they should do that. It will only happen a few times. It's not going to happen a lot because then people just stop going to the movies. Those are the people who are not going to buy tickets for the movies, right? They'll be the type of movie theater you go for a date, to eat food, drink stupid sodas, and, you know, laugh and look at your phone and watch explosions and not really care. I've always said, you know, people come out of these, some of these movies and say, that was great. I want to have a hamburger now. Hamburgers are great. And I think the movie lasts less time than the hamburger does. And genuinely, I think that type of movie going experience has overtaken the, the cinema experience. And I think there's room for both. You should absolutely be able to go and have a sort of, you know, 
you know, multi-faceted experience with food and drink and friends and you can talk and look at your phones and nobody cares. And then you should also have cinemas where you go to where, like the Arclight, like every man, GFT uh, here in Glasgow, you go to these places and you take it seriously because not not to be a po-faced serious, I'm into the one about cinema. It's not that. It's to go and enjoy the or, or or have access to the story that is being told to you in the format that it was intended, and I genuinely think that um, the one format, and I know this is against everything that I'm about, the one format that allows you to do all of that, all of those different types of film watching experiences, is the home experience where you can choose what that's like, and um, I do think there will be a day where every major movie star and, and minor movie star and comedy star and TV star will all have some little bit that they do on Amazon or Netflix or, you know, any of these film services where they tell you what you should do with your telly and why. And, you know, you'll watch them because, oh, this is the one with uh, Schwarzenegger or this is the one with uh, um, Stallone. Uh, this is the one with, um, you know, uh, Sigourney Weaver's done one. And, you know, it'd be quite funny, but every time the message is the same, this is how to watch a movie and this is why you need to switch that bloody phone off even if you're at home. It's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. Um, yeah. yeah uh, Something like that, anyway. And, and then, and, and, and of course, now we have the prolifer- proliferation of TV, uh, maybe a golden age of TV, or we've just yeah. moved on from the golden age of TV. I don't know. Mm. But, uh, you know, um, The Sopranos, The Wire, um, yeah. Mad Men, yeah. Breaking Bad, blah, blah, blah. And then moving yeah. on to what's coming out today. Um so, you know, TV is important, but <clears throat> it's something you picked up on earlier. Um, there are audiences for different things. Mm. So the fact that people are getting a million followers and likes doing turgid shite on Instagram doesn't mean there isn't a, a, an audience for a Joe Rogan podcast. Right. Um yeah, they, bo- they both deserve to exist. Exactly, I, you know, I, yeah. I don't, so long as you're not harming anybody or you're not feeding, par- you're not a parasite feeding from, you know, other sources in order to, you know, feather your own nest, which we see in all sorts of fields. I, I think that, uh, you know, what we call turgid shite is, is what people enjoy watching and, and gives them some enjoyment. I, then great. Love it. Whatever. I'm not going to pick up on that. I don't think. However, um, there's just no excuse in life for saying I don't like that. Therefore, it shouldn't exist. It, you know, with except obviously there are exceptions to that. I mean, we're talking about you know things like human decency and things, but within the boundaries of that, yeah. I mean, if you want to watch people uh, dancing or singing or um, you know playing video games, don't understand it. You want to watch people play video games? I play video games. I can't stand watching anybody else do it because mm-hmm. it's just not interesting. But clearly, I'm in the minority there, and that's fine. There's there's that for some people. There's other things for me. Audiences do not have to be in the gazillions for you know um, forms of storytelling or art or expression to exist. There's room for everybody, and I, I think there's money for everybody. And it's when you filter all that money into the, you know, the stuff that makes the most or can make the most and, and often costs the most. And you don't allow for those things. And what happens is there is going to be a a take up of the of, of the slack. You know, things are going to fill that void. People will express themselves no matter what. Um, but it would be interesting if, uh, you know, we could just be a little bit more uh, understanding isn't the right word, and, and you know, you just allow it. You know, just the stuff. The fact that stuff exists does not threaten me in the least. Tolerant, yeah, tolerant is a, is another thing, but it, it just doesn't bother me that you know Instagram videos get millions of views, and you know, um, magic tricks and short films don't get as many views. Well, let me expand but, that idea yeah. then. That that in the sense that, and I I don't have a problem with any of that per se. But I do have a problem, and it's a difficult one as a magician because we lie, but we mm-hmm. honestly lie. Yeah. To some degree. 
I mean, mm. maybe some don't as well. Some of us, some some do, and some don't. Some yeah. don't, and again, mm. that's fine. I don't. I don't. I'm not even sure I have a problem with that. But I have a problem with the sort of fake reaction, the setup. In and, and so this is coming to the con with you, um, mm-hmm. the real hustle, which I'd like to touch on, and, and the art of the con. Yeah. Um, so I don't, you know, Blaine came out and Blaine reframed the camera on the audience in a TV mm-hmm. way. Yep. And so there was a feeling of um, genuine response to some mm-hmm. degree and perhaps, you know, a little bit of setup, but but still a, a response to very, very visceral um, and old tricks, a reinvention of what meant before, which felt brand new, which was yeah. actually fantastic. It was brilliant, yes, absolutely. Um, and, I, na- and now... I don't think magic works on te- television at all. You know, I, I think magic on TV is not magic. It is the experience of of it's a vicarious experience based on the other people that are are that are in that scene right the magician does this and these people are blown away right and yeah. everybody who talks about vanishing the statue of liberty they are baffled by it but they're they will always mention those people were sitting right there or those people were around the airplane when copperfield made this these are the things that right you know they they accept the experience through the um, the presence and reaction of others. And what Blaine did is, um, you know, he made his show all about that. All about that. And, uh, you know, as you say, it doesn't matter that he does the same trick five times. He does it for five different groups of people and how each person is affected is what's important. Um, and as, you know, somebody who works in, in TV with, you know, lots of different forms, you know, you, you try and tell other producers that, that you know, you, it's not, you don't need more tricks. Right, you need you need more um, experiences, and so you can have multiple experiences from one actual trick. The audience doesn't really have to see what the trick is until the second or third time we've we, you know it doesn't really matter how we tell. To, quite often, you know, a dynamo model is you see the trick once and then you see three or four people reacting to it. And that's a great model. I mean, that's uh, you know obviously founded in Blaine as well, but it is that thing of you know. It's not about yes, you need tricks and you need new 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 effects and all that, but it's not really what it's about. It's not really what people get from watching magic on television. They 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 certainly do want you know they certainly do have a feeling of you know how is that done and they're baffled and they're amazed and all that kind of stuff. But that really feeds off of what's happening to the people around them, and I think that. Uh, you know, how they interact with it as an actual magic effect is absolutely dependent on the veracity of that effect happening for real people when it was recorded. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Darren talks yeah. about the acceptable compromise and the unacceptable mm-hmm. compromise. Mm-hmm. And so there are certain reactions that it's, it's – this is where the problem lies, and Penn Teller talk about it, you know, in, in TV, when we're talking about TV magic. Mm-hmm. So you get the response from the trick and then you have to, it, it, it wasn't film right, well, we need another response or whatever. But yeah. we, got the, we got the real response and it was genuine. Mm-hmm. And then we can do some massaging because it's TV and we edit. But when we yeah. set up, you three are going to react like this. <sighs> can you jump up and down and scream? Could you run away and... And talk about being a step backwards, a step back to the, you know, world's greatest magic specials of, of, you know, which was the old way of doing television where, you know, they would have, you know, the the greatest example of that for a magician is watching Guy Hollingworth, who we all know is one of the greatest magicians alive, right? Guy Hollingworth doing one of his signature pieces with people sitting beside him, facing the camera and looking up at him. And we all know they can see what's going on, right? But they're all sitting there acting, right? They're all sitting there acting. Now, if you're sitting in front of him, you haven't got a chance in hell. Not a chance. It's so beautiful. But no way can you do it with people sitting behind you. And therefore, all of that is plastic. All of that is false. And yet, if you ever watch Guy do it for real people, which we've done many times, it's it just destroys them, right? I mean, it just destroys. 
He was a magic. He was at Magic Live uh, last. Was it last last year when we we could when I yeah, many years ago <laughs> when I saw you there and uh, wow he blew the room apart mm-hmm. literally. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. people's heads were yeah. exploding. An- another one of the uh, great amateur magicians, right? <laughs> it's, you know, um, and charming so, and wonderful, charming as well. Right? Yeah, he's annoying as hell. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But he is, you know, I mean, he's the real deal and always has been a real deal, you know. And uh, it was, I remember watching that when he was on that show. I was so weirdly pleased for him, you know, in that sort of totally non competitive way because we were friends and sort of similar ages. And, you know, obviously he's a very good looking guy. And now he's getting to be on this great show. And I didn't, I, I, I mean, I never ever thought I would want to do that. And I've never wanted to do that. Don't really want to do magic on TV. I was just so thrilled to see it. And then when it came on and he's doing that trick and these people are sitting there, I was like, Oh, I mean, he did it perfectly. I mean, you can see the trick, but you know, where's that energy? And then Blaine came later. He came after that. So it's a step backwards towards that kind of television making by, you know, these, you know, and I mean, you can tell it's false. You can tell it's false. And I've, I've been challenged on many shows, including shows that I've been on, you know, a show I did for the BBC where, you try and tell the producer, just get a reaction. Don't, don't care about what I do. So are we talking about the magicians now? No, no. I, I did a I did a show called Don't Miss a Trick for Objective, which, um, you know, had so many great ideas in it. We had so many great people working on it. Like, you know, Andy Nyman helped us with part of it and uh, Jonathan Goodwin and, you know, myself and Alex were designing stuff and we had lots of great ideas, but it was that format of, you know, guess how it's done afterwards. So we had to design material that wasn't real magic. Because the effect had to be, the method had to be as interesting as the effect, which is a pretty good idea. Didn't like the guessing game part of it. And we came up with some great stuff, but the show was, you know, not particularly, um, wasn't particularly well done. It's not, I'm not, I, I've got no interest in doing magic on TV. And it was not, for me, a great show. And in that, not, uh, not our second producer, but I think our first producer. We had a, a segment where I was, you know, some new agey guy in Camden Market doing um, spoon bending as a demonstration of my powers, right? This was like nice, nice little vignette. And I was all for it. I was all for like being a goofball and wearing a stupid shirt because, you know, I do that all the time anyway. And, <laughs> you know, whatever. And, and uh, Jonathan Goodwin actually had come up with this brilliant method and, you know, we give the whole thing away. We show you how it's done, um, which was that uh, I would show a, a spoon and all these people were around. I said, now, look, I, I want you to take the spoon and put it underneath this cloth. And I would cover it with a cloth and not touch it. And people could go under and just check just to make sure that it was still there. Right. And everybody got a chance to do that. And then I would get somebody's finger and they could touch the bowl of the spoon through the cloth. And as they did that, it popped. I mean, they could feel it pop underneath their fingers. And when I pulled away the, uh, when I pulled away the handkerchief, yeah, you could see that it was bent, right? And people flipped out. And we did this in the offices. Did this in the offices, and uh, everybody flipped out when we did it. It was this great reaction when it popped. And then you know the fact it was bent was pretty much by the by. It was kind of just that big shock reaction. And then on the day. Um, you know, after many arguments with the producer who decided he knew better and didn't, um, he brought along these, you know, the people that sign up for Star Now. Uh, you know, they're there to be the audience. They all turn up like they're going for a night out in Ibiza in, you know, an afternoon in Camden Market. They're all overly made up. They're all overly dressed. Um, the producer tells them, go over there. He's going to do these things. There's going to be a thing that's going to go pop. And uh, I want you all to react. That's what he told them. He told every group that. Didn't matter that we tried to tell them, don't tell them anything, just concentrate on them. We can get there. No, didn't do that. And then afterwards, he got them to do all the reactions again. Now, as you know, um, trained actors don't tend to, you know, turn up for these things, you know. And it was appalling. It was appalling. And what was heartbreaking about it was that we had done this so many times just to try it around and people in the office who'd seen and worked on and produced lots of magic shows all flipped out over this little thing that you know 
Jonathan had come up with and making it pop. And then it was just dead and or dead on arrival, really. And uh, that was so disappointing. And I remember the argument we had when we were in the offices, and I got sort of overvoted. And you know, at the end of the day, I'm on the show. I've got to keep going. And I just was. I still, to this day, even though I don't think the show is particularly great, really, in in my assessment, um, I still look back at that and think, you know, all we needed was a was a better magic producer. And finally, we did half. And then we decided to make it an hour long and in the second half had a better, in fact, not even a better, a great magic producer who put together some fantastic stuff with us for the second half until she left. And then, you know, we ended up, uh, the whole thing was finished kind of, you know, like a wet rag really. But had she been on it for the first half, at least you would have had these great reactions. And that's all I thought we were going to get was one great reaction after another. Instead, we got a bunch of bad actors doing bad acting with no surprises whatsoever. Really, and and that's that's after Blaine. That's after we could watch twenty you know hours of Blaine and say, look, this is why it works. Mm-hmm. And still TV. And I have the same arguments and when I'm producing for other people, trying to explain why you know we don't film the magic first, we film the reactions first. Right. Still, they don't get it. You know, it's really crazy. So you actually you filmed you filmed the reactions first. Try yeah. Um, if you've got three cameras and you've got like a whole group of people surrounding you know your your person right um getting in to see what's happening in there is actually quite tough mm-hmm. right so why do that the first time why don't you just concentrate on the experience everybody's had and then they don't have to act now they can just come and see the trick again and then we can get the trick now a lot of the times that that's just a matter of where you put the camera and of course you'll have you know coverage from a wide or you know, whatever you needed the first time. But general, generally speaking, with certain types of effect, you should absolutely, if, if, you, if you're going to have to choose between one or the two, absolutely go for the reaction because you cannot fake that reaction the second time. And every, you know, every time I get producers who say, absolutely, you can do that. And I, I just, I used to try and argue, I now just call bullshit. <laughs> and I just call it absolute bullshit. And I, 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 I try and I tell them, right, react, do it for me now. Show yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause you're, you know, you work in television. These people don't, you know, and it's absolutely, uh, you, the magician's going to do the trick again. <laughs> you know, you can do it as many times as you want. Uh, they're only going to experience it for the first time once. So I always say, if you've got to choose between the two, you go for the reaction first. And that's not me. That's David Blaine. He figured it out. Yeah, and that's he made, he made his whole show about that. That's a brilliant. brilliant piece of advice. And and you know, even if you're doing a uh, a live gig, if you're doing close up magic or someone's filming you, they've got their iPhone out. You go point it at them. Yeah. There's no point pointing at me. If I put a r- magic reel together, you don't want to see my magic. I don't yeah. want to show you my magic either. I mm. want you to see me and go, yeah, he looks great. But <laughs> I want them to be just going. You know, when I uh, when I when I do shows, I, I I don't do shows very much, but the the show I like doing most is me and twenty people around a big table, and surrounded, you know, or, or forty. I've done it sixty five at one point. Um, crazy numbers of people, but that th- that feeling of everyone being around you is fantastic for me, and it works for the type of magic I like to do. But the thing that, um, especially with the smaller groups of fourteen to twenty, something like that. I try and make it a thing, not just a request, but an actual thing. We want you to give us your phone. I want you to switch your phone off and we're going to put it over there. It's not a magic trick. It's not going to appear in a, in a, in a lemon or something. It's absolutely, and it's a thing. And because what I do is conversational and we talk about stuff, it always comes up. It always comes up. And you know what every single person admits to is that the phone is a barrier between, um, them and 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 real human experiences constantly throughout their lives and that's why we took it away and you know it's funny how it suddenly becomes a positive thing when we talk about that but uh yeah you know when somebody brings up a phone and they they look at it and begin to wonder how many people have never seen anything live (laughs) anymore (laughs) even if they were there yeah and at the castle you know you you're not allowed your phone you're not allowed to take pictures you're not allowed to record it's off 
and yeah, as it should be it's different and they love it because they're sitting down there those you know i used to pack the the hat and hair downstairs um the, the, the you know the far right room with yeah, the little table yeah. which i like the most actually it's lovely because yeah. you just pack them in then you go come forward mm-hmm. come forward you want to stand up at the back and then yeah. you've got that energy and it is like comedy as mm-hmm. well it's like yeah. the, you know and uh we can't do it now but uh they've changed the layout but in in the uh upstairs in the close-up gallery in the old setup before they changed it there used to be a, a walkway around the back you know and it had a banister all the way around and it wasn't much bigger than it is now. It might, it might even be the same size. The seats were a little narrower. Um, didn't have cup holders or anything like that. And uh, so, you know, this is back in the 90s, early 90s, mid 90s. And uh, I remember, you, you know, some of the hosts, I won't name them, but, you know, a couple of the famous old time hosts would come in and go, uh, I've got 55 people in there. <laughs> you yeah, come yeah, out and yeah. be like literally and they'd be standing right beside you and, and you know it was it was fantastic it was fantastic the energy in that room was great because let's face it if there was a fire we were all going to die so we might as well have the time of our lives and that's uh, <laughs> that seemed to be that, that, that energy you can't really get anymore in that particular room because somehow it's not not bad you can still get great energy in that room but somehow that thing of getting all those people around the way that they did and staging them. And, you know, I remember, you know, Larry Jennings was in a wheelchair the first week that he came to see me and he was, the wheelchair would sort of go off to the side and there was these two seats that he used to have there and they took him away and then people sort of went all the way around. And so he'd sit in this wheelchair and it was, he was a big guy. So it was a big wheelchair too. And, um, I can't remember what the host said to him, but, Larry came up and he came up, he knew Larry well. And he said, Larry, you know, you, technically you're taking up two seats. <laughs> Larry's in a wheelchair, right? And he says, uh, oh, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I came out and Larry's sitting there. And, you know, he had this woman sitting in his lap. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that was the solution. And everybody's drinking, everybody's having a great time and, you know, nothing, uh, you know, nothing like that happens there now because, you know, fire regulations being what they are, but that energy that you got, you cannot get it any other way. And uh, I try and get that, and I try and make it like cinema. You know, I want you focused on what's happening here. I don't want you looking down at your phone or feeling a buzz. And I'm sorry, but you know, if you have a babysitter at home, um, you know, and you think she might call, maybe an intimate close-up experience is not the thing to go see. Um. You know, and uh, of course there are people, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm on call. Of course you can keep your phone, no problem. And, you know, you know, if they do get a call, it's probably quite important. But generally speaking, most people are quite happy to put it in a little box and set it off to the side. Um, uh, I did figure out the hard way that you have to mark them all because so many bloody phones look like I did to call. Well, they do those um, bags, don't they, at the concerts now the, that you wear yeah. and they zip them up and... They're locked. Yeah, which is so pathetic that we are that we are so pathetic that they need to do that, and they do need to do that. They do, especially. I feel bad for comedians. You know, I feel bad that pretty much everything a comedian does could be on the internet that night as a meme. And every time I see a really funny meme, I just wonder what comedian wrote that and has lost it to you know the internet. Um, whereas you know you could you could have a set that would last you twenty years in the past. The world doesn't work that way anymore, but my God, you know, going out there and saying something and it's not funny and it still ends up on the internet. Yeah. And, and, and it's brilliantly funny and it ends up, you know, it's terrible. And we come full circle to that ability to make mistakes, learn, change, develop, get it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Finesse, and, you know, hone. Abs- absolutely. You know, it's supposed to be, there's, there's a danger, an inherent danger to putting yourself up in front of an audience or putting yourself up for approval to some extent. I don't, I mean, caring about approval is a big mistake, but you're still doing it to some extent. And taking chances, trying to not play it safe, requires you to absolutely fall on your face from time to time. Absolutely fall on your face from time to time. And, you know, I, 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 I worry that, you know, the, the omnipresent ear and eye that everybody carries around with them has deprived us of something 
Yeah. And um, especially artists, you know, and how they can express freely and safely um, without paying an unnecessary price. What do you think about, um, I want to get onto the real hustle and exposure, um, exposure and magic. I was something I was thinking about uh, the other day, actually, because, and it's, 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 it's really important. In, in a way, maybe it's a good thing. I can see the positive, actually, spin on exposure mm-hmm. now. Because what I say is when people say, you know, oh, well, you know, you, as a performer, people go, oh, I know how you did that. Or you get a kid and they, you pull out a deck of cards and they, oh, I know this one. And you haven't yeah. even done the trick yet. Yeah, I know the card trick. I know the card. Or you do a trick and they go, well, I, I'm just going to Google that. I'm going to Google that one mm-hmm. and find out how it mm-hmm. works. And it's like, well, who gives a fuck? Yeah, good. Well done. I mean, it, I mean, it would be lovely if back in the day you had to buy a magic book, you couldn't find out how things were done and the magic was hidden. But now you've got, I saw a guy, there's a well-known magician that has a YouTube channel, which I was quite, quite shocked. It's a pretty open YouTube channel. And he just tells you how to do magic tricks, some really good things. It, it's re- revelatory. Um... I suppose the thinking is, well, you know, you choose to watch the YouTube video. There's no barrier to exposure. And it's actually, it's inevitable now because every trick on Penn and Teller, there's someone who who watches it and tells you how it's done or how they think it's done or they tell you where to get the information or they reveal everything. So it's more important as a performer to be a good performer doing the magic as well because you can almost hide the ability to find the answer to the trick because it's immersed in the whole experience. I don't think it's ever changed that you need to, that that it's better to be a good performer. I think that's always good. And at the end of the day, you know, a bad card trick in the hands of a great performer can, can be a great card trick because it's really, it's like comedy, you know, there are, you know, people have funny bones and they're just funny. And some people just say funny things. And, the, but with, with magic, you know, it's very easy to, to interpret the, the secrecy in magic as a sort of, I know something you don't and a power trip. And some people absolutely play it that way, which is, you know, not the best, you know, not the best. But personally, I, I feel that, you know, we are supposed to be mystery entertainers. And we do that by sharing experiences that we know the secret to and we protect the audience from that secret because usually it's disappointing anyway. It's not always very, very clever or, you know, as ingenious as they would suppose it is in terms of, you know, what's really going on. But we see the genius in it because we understand the methodology and we understand why, you know, this idea was a lot cleverer than, you know, a a novice or, you know, an outsider might recognize. But the audience is given an experience that is completely um, undermined. It's not not ruined. I'm not necessarily ruined, but it's undermined by the by accessibility to the secret method that helps us to entertain them or to give them a feeling or a share an experience. At the end of the day, you can't stop people from doing whatever the hell they want to do with their YouTube channel. And I just don't understand why, you know, we call anybody who gives away secrets a magician because they're not a magician understands how to create magic with mundane secrets. Ultimately, right. You know, these methods are fascinating to us. I love them. You love them. You know, you've got tons of them behind you on your shelf. I got tons of them behind me on the shelf that we'll never ever do, but we get a great deal of entertainment out of exploring it. And it's not just, oh, I wonder how that's done. It's like, wow, that's clever. That thinking is great. I love what he said there. Oh, well, maybe I could do that in another trick. You know, that's the, the experience. And in the past, you know, the mass magician was an asshole. And, uh, but, you know, some of the methods he gave away were absolutely ridiculous and never done by a magician. But even when he gave away something that we did do, it was, you know, People would say, the problem of it was people would say, ah, I know how that was done. I saw it in The Masked Magician. I don't really remember. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I remember being exposed to it at some point. Now they can search for that. 
and look it up and get a reminder. Or they can watch a trick and go, um, okay, shuffle, cards, face up, face down, magic. And but bang, there's a 14-year-old who's just learned it, getting hits on YouTube for giving it away because that's all he or she cares about. It's usually he. So, and it, listen, it's just wrong. If you want to be a magician, it's wrong. If you don't want to be a magician, if you just want to be a YouTube star, then you're, you're a parasite <laughs> on magic. You're using magic for your own goal because we've made it available to you. We all have. I've, I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. We've all, you know, I put out magic videos and people can watch that and then do whatever they want with it. And that's a problem because the inherent trust and the, you know, that thing that we never actually did where we swore secrecy, we never actually did it, but we always kind of assumed that you got that it was the right thing to do. That no longer matters because you have guys, you know, um, you know, I'm not going to name names. I really want to, but I don't want to at the same time. But you have guys out there who are just doing it to build, you know, followings. And they don't care about magic. We, 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 know, we know who you're talking about. Um, you don't have to name names. We know. We know. Well, yeah, well, I, but I, I don't know if you do. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I don't. I mean, who do you think I'm talking about? I don't want to say. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I got into a spat with a guy, a little bit of a spat with a guy over something of mine that he was that was on his channel. It was not something of mine, something of a French friend. And I just was annoyed that, you know, here it is being taught for free. Now I teach it in a video that we sell. It's not about the money. We don't sell very many of them. I just want people to have it as a tool to use, not have it bounced all over the internet, especially with somebody with a, a big following. And, you know, it didn't, it wasn't the most productive of things in terms of, you know, we didn't really get into a discussion, but there was a sort of apology. Um, you know, he, he said, you know, I'm an older guy. I don't really understand how the internet works. I, I helped build the fucking internet, right? When I was in the computer business, I understand how the internet works, exactly how it works. But I do understand that the community um, and the, 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 the following process and the building of an audience process and the, in, and the engagement and interaction and the way people come to magic has changed. And he's right about that. In, in actual fact, I genuinely believe that guy, as uh, you know, he did say, you know, I'm going to do something different. And he has. You know, he still, I think there's maybe a couple of magic tricks he's exposed since. But it's not about that anymore for this guy. This guy's about other stuff. and But at the same time, he's still connecting to magic and puzzles and to other things. And I actually quite like what he's doing now. And, you know, that's, to me, I think that he has done really great job of doing something very smart and difficult other guys are not willing to do that and uh, they're just going to keep taking and you know uh, one in particular you know he, you know he plays the victim because he gets called out and i've got no sympathy for the guy and um i'm sorry but you know you take something in mind you teach it badly even but you're still teaching it you're giving it away and you don't even know it's mine you don't know whose it is you just think it's a neat trick you know you should just just apologize, talk to me and move on. We can disagree. I can say to you, I don't agree with that. It's your channel, do what you want. Just don't do my stuff or I'll call you again. And, and you know, after we've had an interaction, maybe I'll be able to cont contact you directly. But at the end of the day, I've got a lot more respect for the guy who rethinks and actually does something bigger and better as a result of rethinking. Because at the end of the day, as people come to magic, they're not going to go to the magic shop like we did, or they're not going to go and find a book in the middle of an old dusty shop like I did. They're going to find it on the internet, and they're going to find it through these guys. Um, and if they do that, and that's all they know, they'll be able to do some wonderful things that don't belong to the people that taught them. And I just don't know if they'll have the passion for magic that will be as enduring or as valuable or as long lasting or as, you know, refined and, you know, as it just, I just wonder if that's a great way to come to magic. So the real truth is, is that the, these people that we're talking about, if they get, if they get it right, right, because there's plenty of tricks that you can share and teach in a way that is good for everybody. And I don't, I'm not talking about 
bad tricks. I'm talking great tricks, great old tricks that nobody's doing anymore that don't harm other performers and other performers who are spending money and time and many years of practice. But these guys, if they get it right, they are going to be the the gatekeepers for the next generation. And so really I hope that they do a better job. And like I said, the guy that we we started talking about, you probably know who it is, I think he did a terrific job of, you know, not because of me, not because I said anything. I, I just think he realized that that's not what he wanted to be about. Good. And, you know, maybe he'll change his mind tomorrow. But, you know, I think what he's doing is bringing people into the art and being a really good, you know, if you wanted to get into magic and, and puzzles and deception and mysterious stuff, here's a guy that can show it to you and, and take you into that world. Whereas there are other guys who I just think they want your money for a deck of cards or a t-shirt or something, and they use my tricks to sell that. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's really very fair. And I see, I see those. I mean, I, I think I know with the puzzle person uh, that might be, but the, and I have no problem with the the social media guys doing their pranks and magic. I have no, really mm-hmm. don't. But when it's done badly and it's that fake, that non-response, that setup. I think it is damaging, um, and and they lose their yeah. own reputation. Now, you can argue, well, they got a million followers, you know, making money. And I, believe me, I get that. Good, and I, I no criticism of that per se. But you can improve, and you can develop, and well, yeah, but they've got a million followers, and how are they doing it? They're doing it, as I said, it's this parasitic right. um, behavior because they can only do it by they can only keep taking if we're talking about the people that are doing that, people that are doing the fake reaction stuff, you know, you know, I've been in rooms, you know, for big network shows where names have come up and I've explained that that's what they do. Right. And shown them that's what they do. Look, this is what's going on. And this is the exposure reel. And here's the other thing. And, and, you know, they tend to gravitate towards people that are more authentic because they're going to have to work with them. Right. So, it doesn't really do you any good. There is a point where you've gone as far as you can go. And if I'm not in that room and somebody does end up making a show with you, it's not going any further than that because you don't have anything. You're going to disappoint everybody, including yourself. Everybody deserves a break based on what they've brought to the table, not what they've taken from someone else's table. So you developed, I mean, was it? did you do a, a comprehensive, was it Erdene's, uh DVD? Or, I remember something you did where... Uh, I did uh, Royal Road to Carb Magic. Royal Road to Carb Magic, you did. Yes. And it was super in depth, hmm. um, which is really worth checking out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, that was an interesting project because I read that book, at, you know, I was rereading it and I thought, you know, this would make a great video project if you, because of the way it's written, because of the way it's ordered. I really wanted to try and uh, encourage people to watch the video and read the book and then watch the video. Right. So it's like, you know, read the book. If you don't understand it, you're going to understand it in a minute and you'll learn more about how to get something out of a book. And that's kind of the theme of it. And, uh, you know, Tim Trono worked on that with me with uh, Murphy's Magic. And um, we, uh, you know, one of the things we decided was let's not have one of these audiences because let's just have a group of people and let's just tell them. You don't have to clap for everything. We don't have to have that. The exact opposite of what you're talking about. Because you're just here to help us illustrate how these tricks w- would play. That's all you're here for. And um, the the goal was to create a, a course for people to learn magic. And I think we did a good job of that. And, uh, you know, um, I know early sets were always sold with the book, which was the intention. I don't know about the sets they sell now. I don't make any money from it anymore. But um, it's... Uh, it was an interesting project. And what was more interesting was as soon as word kind of came out that it was coming, it was going to take about four months or something before it actually came out. One of these companies that just steals everybody's ideas, they brought out a disc of a disc set of Royal Road to Card Magic right. with, you know, um, actually a very good card magician. But it was all rushed and done with a couple of cameras and, you know, it didn't, it never, it never dealt with the problems of the book, which I tried to deal with. And it never limited it to... You know, we put a lot of thought into what was in that set and what was not in that set and how we did it. And, you know, they just kind of rushed it out. And I felt bad, although I was really pissed off at the time. Later on, when I sort of, you know, got to know a little bit about the the performer that they'd hired to do it, essentially, 
who may have had the same idea independently, I don't know. But they knew what they were doing when they took it. It was one of those companies that did that all mm-hmm. the time. Um, you know, so so when and that came out like a week or something before ours, <laughs> you know. So but, you know, anyway, it's it's out there and people can buy it. It's a little cheaper than ours, even though ours is a pretty good deal. But you know, and it's uh it was a lot of work to do that and um Occasionally, I find the entire set has been uploaded on YouTube by some helpful right. teenager. Right. It's um, something like Erdenes, which is a book on card cheating. Uh, it's about um, the con, isn't and magic. it, really? A little bit, yeah. yeah. And magic. It's, it's, well, half of it is about the art and the science and art of, uh, of deception with playing cards at the card table, and the other is for magic. It's so, a, you know. But it's an, it's an interesting thing because it's a book that, you know, so if we go before the exposure of the internet, perhaps, was available in all libraries, uh, even on the internet. It's a, a book you could buy on Amazon. It was, always was. It, it was the open safe book, I always thought. You know, it's just sitting yeah. there. If you want it, it's there, sitting there. And mm-hmm. it's an amazing, um, it's actually an amazing book worth worth a lot of time to put into because there's some great ideas in it. Yeah. It's a book uh, for connoisseurs really because you have to have a you know, a real taste for for the art of, you know, card manipulation, secret card manipulation. Um and I I, I think that uh you know I get a great deal of reading, you know, Jason and I went through the book again recently in order to do a talk, which I know they recorded, but we're going to probably do a sort of companion talk because it was so late and rambling and it really was late into the night that um, the, the hotel closed us down. <laughs> um, but, you know, we were just trying to say, look, you know, here are some really cool points that you can look at. One of the points I would say is, um, you know, how, how many people have learned the, the Monty throw for three card Monty? Yet, you know, there are two Monty throws taught in that book. And the second one's actually pretty damn good. I don't really see a lot of people do it, if anybody. Um, but it is a little bit different to the standard hype move. Most people don't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, you know, there's some good information in there on all sorts of stuff for for three card Monty. Which, so you know, I I have a there's a little blue book sitting around here somewhere. Which uh, is that it right there? So uh, here you go. Notes on our nice. And this is just full of, uh, you know, bits and pieces of, you know. <laughs> so, and this is all notes of, of going through the book that I found on top of what's in the Vernon thing. And, you know, we talked all of that through. But, yeah, you know, as you go through this, you, you find there's just little things that um, he did that that you can you can just read it for interest or you could go, oh, I could maybe adapt that to something or make something out of that. Um, but, you know, he starts making comments in there on presentation that are still you know, worthy today you know it's all a little formal um and maybe even pretentious to today's reader but uh you know he says things like um but it was 1900 wasn't it it was 1902 yeah um patter apparently describes procedure when the contrary is the case that's a that's a deep that's, that's deep you gotta think about that now that's in there, and you know, there's there's whole stuff in there about shifts, and he's got advice on when to do the shift and how to do the shift. But you know, it's it's kind of like wine. You know, you've got to get a taste for it before you really appreciate a decent bottle of wine. And um, I think the book is is in the possession of many people as an interesting object. Not a lot of people have read it. Um, and if you can encourage people to read it, you know, Aaron Fisher and I used to read it to each other. This is pathetic, in a way. But the reason we did that was we were trying to see if we would notice something by reading it aloud and listening to it. And we did. We absolutely picked up little nuggets. And it's a funny thing, that book. You know, as much as, you know, I think if you've got the new Steve Forty books and you find out what Steve thinks of the book and his analysis is all completely accurate, I'm 100% behind it. Still, um, the book presents the art form in a way that I think is extremely important to the history of the art form. And it has so much detail kind of crammed and condensed into paragraphs that you miss three or four cogent points on your first read through or your second. So to really untangle all of that, to unpack it, to unzip it, 
takes real study. And so, yeah, you know, it's true. There are many better methods for cheating from that period. And maybe Erdnays didn't really know very much about what was really going on. He only knew about what he developed for himself or what interested him or her, which it could very well be. I mean, I would bet not, but whoever it was, whatever their reasons for hiding their identity, it could just have been showmanship, you know? You know, a pseudonym will sell more books. I don't know. But at the end of the day, whoever it was, I think, was absolutely genuinely fascinated by sleight of hand technique with cards, and they presented it and taught it in a way that I think was exemplary for the period. And, you know, so it's still a great book. And I, I really... I really enjoy reading it. And, you know, there's magic stuff in there that you can show it to people and you go, oh, where's that? Oh, it's in Erdnays. You know? There's a, there's a trick in there. It's true. It's, I, I talk about it all the time. There's a trick in there where you genuinely read the mind of the spectator. Genuinely read the mind of a spectator and produce the card they're thinking of. How many tricks can say that genuinely you're reading the mind of anybody? And what you're reading and how you're getting it, I'm not going to talk about that. It's in the book. But, you know, it's compelling. And it's a fascinating, I mean, it's somewhere up there. I'm sure, I know it's with me. Um, it's small. It's, uh, it's small. It's a pam. It's not big. It's not one of these. It's No, no, it's a, It's just not a huge book. Um, you know, I've, I have many copies lying around here. But it's, uh, you know, there are many variations and, and versions. There you go. So that's the Dover edition right there. Um, so very was... bad illustration on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> I've never put any notes in it. I just remember, I remember getting just stuck at the beginning of it and just going over and over yeah. the beginning because there was so there was some great shuffling ideas and it was like, mm-hmm. you know, really, that I don't need to go further than that. There's there's stuff in there, literally, that, you know, I remember when I first met Steve Forty and he's doing all this stuff, it's crazy, and it's like, it's just in her <laughs> He was right. It was, you know, just top controls and slugs. And, you know, he does it better and he does it, but the actual core effect, the core method is just in earnings, you know, and, um, you know, I, there's all sorts of things in there. I keep finding little nuggets. Um, and it, you know, it's a, for me, it's a great book. I really get a lot out of reading it and rereading it from time to time. I talk about it for, you know, with my audiences and, um, you know, there's 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 other books out there. You don't have to read it. You know, you don't have to read a book ever. You could be a great card magician just watching YouTube clips, I suppose. But you know, it's kind of like uh, you know, loving the movies and only seeing um, you know, only seeing what comes out from the big studios. So, missing a lot. So, in terms of revelation, now then, in the real hustle, you are revealing things. Mm-hmm. Now. The Real Hustle was a fantastic show. You did six seasons, is it? Eleven. Eleven seasons. Eleven seasons. Wow. Yeah, over six years. Six years, that's what I... Mm-hmm. Eleven seasons over six years, right. <laughs> that's insane. Yep. Um, that was insane. Now, is there a point where you're, you're really searching for it, for the, the cons, because at the beginning I would imagine you have your go-to stuff that you'd love to get out there and try Mm -hmm. and develop and then as it goes on are you having to overly create or find or I mean how does it the the BBC had a very simple rule for them which was you have to show us that this scam has happened we can't just like make up scams and fool people that they didn't want that right we were always there kind of you know um uh, I think the old uh, horrible term was redheaded stepchild. Um, Where did it but, come? You know, how did it come to be? I mean, who, who, you worked with Alexis well, Conran on it. I uh, I was initially called by Anthony Owen, who's a good friend, um, to come and consult essentially for the show because I was doing a show in the states called The Takedown, and they wanted me to come over and just sort of talk about it. And we went and we went to basically Spearmint Rhino. They had a function room during the day. And we went downstairs and recorded the session. And it was me, um, Alexis, and Drummond Money Coots. A young, young, young Drummond Money Coots. And uh, we did this thing and the BBC looked at it and they, they basically said, you know, we want this guy and, and we want this guy. And, you know, I think they felt there was more authenticity with, you know, the big guy and the sort of, you know, uh, swarthy, uh, you know, Greek <laughs> type. And uh, 
and Drummond was very well spoken and, you know, he was doing magic really. Almost everything was sort of like a magic trick. Whereas, you know, there's some, it was my field of expertise already. Alex loved it and could talk about it with some confidence and, and knowledge, of course. Whereas I think, you know, Drummond wasn't for Drummond. You know, I didn't think it was a great idea for him to be on a show about scams when his, his family or coots the bank, you know, but <laughs> um, probably for him, it was good because of where he went afterwards. I mean, you know, he's as a magician, I think that was a better direction. So I ended up, um, you know, working on the pilot, which was tough. And then after we got the pilot off and we were going to make the show, we sat down and we wrote down the scams that we were going to put into the first season. And it was a lot of it was down to what we could accomplish. And we had to do five in an episode and, you know, one bar bet and four scams. And so, you know, when we got the second series, it was like, okay, so what are we going to do now? And really, you know, I mean, there are so many books here on constant scams. There is an un never ending list of scams that are being done and you know the 419 scam is done 20 different ways so we could do all of those if we wanted to you know it's essentially the same thing do this and we'll give you money for free but you know we would go through this writing period i mean that was six years those six years were we couldn't do anything else really because we would basically finish the series and get picked up and we'd be back within a few weeks and alex and i were in from day one we were in before the rest of the 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 production crew came in that doesn't happen on most shows but they needed alex and i there to write it to to put it together and we would sit with david britland and andy nyman would come in in the first series and you know we talk about how we were going to do things and you know david would submit a list and i would submit a list and then we'd all put it up on the wall and figure out what we want to do and of course anything that we didn't do would then roll over to the next series and by that time we'd heard of 20 more cons that we could maybe use and um, everybody was now telling us about scams as well. So it wasn't, I mean, we could have done a 12 series. I just didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to do it anymore. I was burnt out. I really burnt out. And I was, I was just not happy making real hustles anymore because I felt like it, you know, wasn't special. And I wanted to make some films, you know, this was all I cared about at that point is I wanted to go and make films. So, you know, the smart thing to have done would have been to say, let's just not do one for another year. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way TV works. Right. They they want it. They want it now. So we just didn't, you know, we didn't really push it and uh, it never really happened. I mean, certainly we could have stopped at nine. I think 10 and 11 came about because, you know, we said we've got the material and, you know, we could film it in Scotland, which would, you know, BBC wants you to spend money all over the country. And that would mean that, uh, we could film a lot of it in Scotland, which we did, which, which proved to be a nightmare on its own, simply because, you know, in London, if you sort of try and con a, uh, a waitress behind the counter at a cafe to give you money for some, you know, like a USB stick that you found that someone's offering a reward for. It's the old ring scam, right? You know, um, we had this kid, Jazz, Jazz and Polly came onto the show and, you know, um, they, they'd never even been in Scotland before, as far as I could tell. And they're in a, Glasgow cafe and Jazz is trying to con this barmaid after Alex, you know, Alex had come in and said, I've lost my USB stick. If anybody finds it, I'll give them a hundred pounds. Leaves. <laughs> Jazz pretends to find it. I'm across the street with a production crew. And uh, he says, uh, yeah, well, if it's, oh, well, this guy's going to give you a hundred pounds. I've got to go. If you give me 50, you can keep the rest. You know, that's the scam. That's the ring scam. It's basic. But, you know, Jazz has never done this before. And they really got lucky with me, Alex and Jess, and that we could do it really. Um, all three of us just did it. We we could do it because we were given the money back, and because we weren't real thieves, it really helped. But anybody else, all the celebrities we came in and did the show, all of them had problems. You know, actually, once you tell them the story, and then the story starts to change, they all had problems with it. Well, Jazz, you know, bless him. This is probably one of his first scams that he did. He's trying his best with this waitress, and she says, "Why don't you just give it? The guy lost it. You don't, you don't need the reward, even. You know, she's been really decent." <laughs> and he's trying to do the scam in London. That could have kept going until she just told him to get lost or gave him some money. In Glasgow, five minutes in, this, this big burly guy stands up, snatches the USB out of Jazz's hand, and says, "Give it to her." <laughs> and hands it over to her, and poor Jazz is like, "What?" And you know. And of course, also in Scotland, you know, I almost got my face plowed in by a guy with a camera because I stole his lens. You know, it was a very different <laughs> landscape <laughs> to do scams in. 
you know, come to Scotland and uh, con as many people as you like, but you will eventually end up in hospital. I Where think. is the line between it being a con and a magic trick? Well, you know, if, you know, if you're trying to take something from somebody that you know by deception, then you're into con territory, of course. A uh, magic trick is an experience designed to evoke a feeling. Um, that feeling should hopefully be positive. It can be frightening. It can be it could even be upsetting. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. what kind of artist are you? But in a con, you're trying to take something and keep something that isn't yours and under false pretenses. So, you know, it is very like a magic trick. I mean, there's a form of deception that is not dissimilar. And the methodology can be the same. Absolutely. You know, we did things with switching money and switching cards at the table and all that kind of stuff. Methodology is the same, but the objective is very different. And are there points where you won't reveal on that show? Yes, um, there were types of scams we would never do. We did. We, we avoided doing scams on older people because they were the most common victims of all the scams we did. You could always look at the victims. It was like an older age range were targeted. So we wanted to prove it wasn't just old people that fell for scams because they were lonely or they didn't understand how the internet worked or whatever reasons people give, which is all bullshit, frankly. Um, we wanted to say, no, no, you can fall for this too and we'll prove it. And that's what we did. And um, romance, romance scams where you play with people's feelings like that, which is very, very dangerous, which people do and make a lot of money. Um, but in revealing the methodology behind it, would you always reveal the methodology? Um, not always. We sometimes reveal part of it and not if, if you could just take that and go do it, like with some of the, you know, like a card cheating scam where, you know, we just show you exactly what you do and put it where and how to do it. We wouldn't do that. We would allude to part of it, or we would even change the method a little bit so that, you know, it wouldn't be practical for anybody to take and use. None of us wanted to be training con artists. All of it was based on the idea that people are already doing this. There's plenty of them, right? The the only reason they get away with it, and this is in um, Sharps and Flats by Masculines over there. Sharps and Flats, he says very clearly at the beginning that the only reason people get away with these, he calls them quackeries, is because of the ignorance of the public to the many ways that they can be cheated and deceived. And so we, the show was based on that whole idea of if, um, if we tell the public, you, you know, people have been scammed like this, they'll always say, oh, they're stupid. But if we get let them see the scam in action, they can put themselves into the role of the victim and say, I would fall for that. And that's the reaction we got most commonly. And that meant that the real hustle accomplished way more and i swear to you this is true it accomplished way more in protecting the public in our 11 seasons than consumer affairs shows like watchdog can ever hope to achieve because they don't entertain we entertained people we showed them this kind of candid camera moment where people got conned then they talked about it afterwards and then if somebody were to walk into that same scam the next day they'd go well wait a minute i know exactly what this is because I saw it in the real hustle, and the police were getting those reports a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, I someone tried to con me, but I knew it was a con because I saw it in the real hustle. That, that, you know, but yes, we were careful about what we showed. Of course, we were. Um, but you know, at the same time, um, you know, we we showed enough that you know, if you wanted to start a career as a con artist, I'm sure you could watch Real Hustle and go out and uh, you know try something out. But the problem is, is that what really makes a con artist is not those secrets, those methods those things we say or those stories that we tell, what really makes a con artist is, you know, this black-hearted refusal to accept responsibility for the consequences mm-hmm. of your actions. Um, you know, that you have to have the soul of a con artist, which pe- people don't really have. I mean, I don't care if you've, you, you know, even a thief, you know. We can show you how to pick po- pockets. We don't give you all the details of exactly what you do. We had to learn that. Well, I'm not a professional pickpocket. I'm not Apollo Robbins. Right, but I do know how to cozy up to you and get my get my hand into your pocket without you feeling it. Right, in a train station, or in a packed uh, you know crosswalk, you know, or you know, um, on an escalator. All these places where real pickpocketing happens, but there are certain details that we we always try and leave out. It's uh, it, yeah, I remember it was very impactful at the time. There was nothing like it. There'd been nothing like it. Uh, yeah, came. it was a good show. I, I mean, look, we've we've talked recently. I mean, before the pandemic happened, we were talking about maybe doing something fresh with it, and uh, you know, keeping that entertainment and exposure and experience factor. 
Um, you know, th- times have changed. You can't do some of the things we did before. You know, it was kind of, you know, TV has changed a little bit. But I think uh, we could do something really brilliant and amazing with the three of us helping the public that unlike, you know, another series of yet another bunch of real hustles, which is what we were talking about at the time, unlike that, I think it would actually be really interesting, exciting and um, and fun. And you know what? It It's not a show that uh, has gone away. I, got, I get recognised all the time. Alex gets recognised all the time. The two of us get together in London like we did, you know, a few months ago. You know, it's, it's, you, you just can't get away with it. There's no doubt it's us. And, you know, I walked into a cafe in Oxford a few weeks ago with, you know, glasses on, a mask and a, wool, and a woolly hat. And the guy said, you're the guy from your hospital. <laughs> <laughs> what chance do I have? Yeah. What chance do I have? Well, Borat's so, managed you know, to do it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you know, he seems to be better at it than I am. I, I think uh, I will have to, um, I will have to think about what we do if we do another thing with the real hustle but i do think that alex chess and i connected um with pe- with enough people that because we could come to them with more information and deliver it to them in a different and more ent- entertaining way it would be really nice to see if uh if that takes because if people are still recognizing us today and still they like the show and all that stuff and it's doing really well online then maybe we should do something else with it. And um, the only thing I'd ask is that it doesn't consume so much of my time because, you know, mm-hmm. there's got movies to make and stuff. You know? Right. So on that, on that le- uh, let's, let's, let's just talk about that and, and uh, finish off with that, actually, mm. with, the, with the films, because I think that's the, the core of you, uh, where you'd like to go. Um, and what's, what's next on the agenda? And, and, and what would you like it to be? I mean, what, what's the push out? Or is that um, beyond our control? Is that just... It's it's a little bit beyond our control. I mean, the pandemic changes everything, um, how we respond to it. It's interesting that, you know, even with the lockdowns in the UK recently, they've said that, you know, film and TV production can continue. And while there are ways to do that that are, that are good and safe, and, you know, the problem is insurance. You know, the insurance companies don't want to insure an entire public you know, production in case somebody gets COVID. But there are ways around that, and that has to be one of the things we look at. Uh, you know, we're working on a um, on a film at the moment, which you know we're talking to financiers, waiting for you know word from various people. It's it's a uh, you know it's 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 not a hugely expensive movie, but it's you know more expensive than anything I've done so far. And it's uh you know it's it's a, it's a ghost story, so it's interesting to me because it does something different with a ghost story, and I like it. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. If it happens, it would be great because we've got the most amazing location. We've solved all the COVID problems because of how we would make it. And we just got to hope that somebody wants to invest in it and thinks they can take it and sell it. And then you've got to figure out who you're working with. But that would be lovely to do because it does marry the illusion magic stuff with the filmmaking aspect because we are going to be, the, uh, you know, illusion will be a massive factor in how we accomplish the story, or how we tell the story. Um, and then, you know, there's other stuff, you know, I've got this crazy vampire thing that we've been trying to pull off for a couple of years. Everybody loves it, but the money needed for it is not cheap. It's not, it's not massive, you know, I'm not talking hundreds of millions or anything, but it is certainly a, you know, a couple of million pounds required for something like that to make it. And um, in order to get that kind of money, you've just got to make sure it'll sell. And then to do that is a business entirely of itself, which I'm not. You know, I've I've spent my time learning how to make films. There's a whole other side to the business which has to be accomplished as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and those those are the things that you know are the features. We just did a we just did a short during the lockdown, um, working with a local. We got a great sort of boutique acting school here, ACS, and they've got this you know amazing list of private clients, and they've been you know one year, two year courses, and they do one on ones and stuff, and. Um, I've, I've been working with them since, you know, I, I went to them and trained as an actor with them because I wanted to understand how to talk to actors, really. I thought that was important. And, uh, you know, I did the obligatory, you know, um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross did with them and all this kind of stuff just to understand where they were coming from. And I like their approach. I like their style. They're friends. And this year's class, very talented class, is, is always, always distinct, interesting 
um, young actors. They uh, they didn't get what they normally get out of this year because of the pandemic. They've you know they, they usually do something like three plays at the Edinburgh Festival, with them all rotating parts. That's an amazing experience, and all rotating in the plays as well. An amazing experience, and then they do short, tiny little short films and sort of monologues, and they do all this stuff. But this year has been a bit of a nightmare because of all of the th- stuff. So we we made a short film with them, and uh, it was a short film that I wanted to make. And you know, obviously, we didn't have enough money, but we did it anyway. And in order to make it, we we, we there's four characters in it. Two of the characters were played by 21 of the students. So it was an interesting experiment to design the shots, knowing that every one of the shots would have to be done for one character 10 times and for another character 11 times. So that you would have 10 performances to choose from for that character and 11 performances to choose from for that character. And every one of the acting students would get a chance to study, interpret, read and create that role, how they would do it. And what we got was we got 10 distinct different performances for one character and 11 distinct performances for the other character. And meanwhile, we had to shoot in the other direction for two actors who were in all of it. So we we shot that. So it was partly an experience that was essential to their education. So they would, they've all worked on a film set now. We brought in, you know, we brought in red cameras, we brought in proper gaffers and, you know, proper lighting. We, we so there, are there 10 or 11 room. versions of it then? Out there, there are. Um, you I only just ever saw one on, one on YouTube, it's just come on. Yeah, that's the one, that's, that's the real one. That's, so I basically had to choose two of the actors, which right. is a nightmare. I had no idea. <laughs> it was a nightmare. I think, look, they're, they're professionals, even though they're young amateurs, you know, they're, they're, they're not amateurs, they're, they're training to be professionals, they're young training actors they knew going in only two of them were going to be in the final version but welcome to showbiz kids welcome to showbiz right exactly but you know we all rehearsed together i talked with them i had my favorites going in and you know i thought maybe i'm going to go for this one and this one and i actually went for two different entirely different people not because they were better or worse than than it's just the combination of those two was the best combination Hmm that I could see across all of them to make the, you know, to make this, to tell the story the way I wanted to tell it. And then of course, me being me, you know, we, we got all this edited together and we had all sorts of, you know, a few technical issues to iron out, which took a few months. And then um, while all of that was going on and I'm busy with the guys doing that, I just said, you know, we're going to edit 10 more versions of this film. (laughs) And give them to these students for their reels. Now, that's all they can use them for. They use it for their reels. So they can take the scene out and drop it into their reel and put that online if they want to. They can't put out the whole version of the movie because I don't really want to have... I'm asking them if they're ever listening to this. I don't want to have, you know, 11 versions of this film out there, really. One version of the film is enough. But I do want you to be able to say, this is what I did with that character. And I want to say, this is what I did with that character. Because they are all different. And I'll tell you what, when I was re-editing and going through the whole thing again, you know, the two detective characters are in it. They're, they're constant. They're in, all of their shots stay the same. And some over the shoulders, you know, you're actually seeing the, the actor I chose because they came back in to do some over the shoulder stuff. So, you know, a guy would be sitting there. And then if you were really paying attention, you might notice that the over the shoulder is of a girl with long hair. But... Other than things like that, you're getting the whole thing cut together. And you, you're familiar with the Kuleshov effect? The, no. So the Kuleshov like... effect is when, um, actually, you know, I think it's Andre Kuleshov gets the credit, but I think his wife actually designed the experiment where um, he stood, filmed himself looking at something and then filmed what he was looking at and cut it together. And you got an impression on that. But then he filmed something else and cut it together with the same footage of him looking and it gave you a different feeling of what he was looking at. Right. And that's called, you know, and the best example was the exact same experiment repeated by uh, Hitchcock where he filmed himself looking at a child playing. It looks like a kindly old man watching a child play in the park. But then he cuts it to a girl sunbathing and now he looks like a dirty old man, you know, and it's the same footage, but it, how, it, how it juxtaposes with the other scene is interesting. I got to live that by cutting all of these together. And seeing what they all did, and um, it was really interesting. So they all all have something for the real. So little bits and pieces of the other film will pop up, 
on the internet and they are quite interesting but um you know i wouldn't recommend anybody watching them all back to back because that is <laughs> that is a bit uh, what's it called was a bit of a thing uh it's called trilemma and uh i love this i love the twilight zone and i, I love particular types of science fiction that open up uh, possibilities and you know i um i wanted to I wanted to make something that ended with lots of questions, but the answers are actually in what you just saw. Uh, you know, you can, if you want, go and watch it again. And some people actually have, and they've gotten pretty damn close. But it's really about you know making you ask the question. And uh, and believe it or not, I mean, I'll end on this, but believe it or not, it's actually based on a concept for a very unusual type of magic trick that I talked to Juan Tamaris about one night. And he told me about this idea for a magic trick and he said it's great and people are just, you know, it, it gives us a completely different reaction because it's some sort of incomplete thing. And and then later that night, as we were walking home, some people wanted to see some magic and uh, he did that trick. And he was absolutely right. It was just this, you know, everybody was, there was like frustration. Uh, they were compelled. It was all of these things coming together. But I thought that's a great way to tell a story. And leave the story up to them to, to to reconstruct it, which is not unusual in, in film. It happens in other places, but uh, so this was an attempt to do that on you know zero money, filmed in one room in one alley, <laughs> and during during a worldwide pandemic where you know everybody outside of the crew had to wear face masks when they weren't on camera. So it was a bit crazy, but anyway, it's out there. It's called Trilemma, and uh, you know just a short film that kept us all quite busy and I think gave the actors a really valuable and um, you know it's really impressive when you see young actors get in front of a big I mean a big we had a proper red camera you know we didn't uh, you know we didn't film this on a, a little thing and that was partly because I wanted to shoot on you know on, on a format that I'm comfortable with but I also wanted them to go in and face that big ugly eye you know and just get on with it. And they all did, all of them, amazingly, you know. And uh, so that's a very valuable experience for them. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. Where can people see um, Isolani as well? Um, it's currently on a couple of platforms in the States. Uh, Gravitas uh, Ventures, so indie distribution, they, they handle it. I think it's on, uh, certainly on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's slowly rolling out to other platforms you know, it could pop up anywhere the way Gravitas works. So um, I can't remember any of the other ones that are streaming on at the moment. But uh, if you search for Isolani film, you know, there's not a lot of Isolani <laughs> movies kicking about. And, Brilliant. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a murder mystery sort of, um, you know, drama with a chess motif. And, uh, you know, so maybe uh, maybe Queen's Gambit will get a little bit of a push. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of murdering in Queensland. And uh, we, if anyone wants to uh, fund your movies, uh, just get in contact. We will make it happen. Yeah, yeah. If you've, uh, you know, if you, this is the time to be a movie mogul. If you've got the money, it is soon going to be a seller's market. Mm -hmm. So it is going to hopefully change things a little bit. What we're finding is, you know, we've got some money already for this new fit feature and the. Uh, we are talking to people and they're all like, yeah, yeah, you know, maybe I'll help. But, um, if you've got that money, maybe you want to put it into our movie <laughs> and they'll bring up this other one <laughs> yeah. like this. And so suddenly you've got this, uh, you know, everybody's got a movie. So, you know, and I can't, it's that thing we said earlier, you know, because of the pandemic, everybody's going to have a book next year. And, you know, so, the yeah, pandemic anyway. guide. Yeah. It's been a strange and, and weird time. And just remember, you know, we'll finish on this. Mm -hmm. The last time there was a worldwide pandemic uh, was uh, what 1918, when the, like the real, you know, the the one that we all remember. Uh, I mean, there have been other pandemics, but you know, the Spanish flu pandemic 1918 was followed by the the Roaring Twenties. So maybe, definitely, maybe when this is all over, it's going to be, uh, you know, party and positive, and you know. Um, I might uh, I might actually make a comedy oh excellent well I'm available I'm going to laugh about it right now but I <laughs> think of something 
Well, listen, on that positive note, I think it's a perfect time to end. Thanks so much, Paul, for being my guest today. It's been um, it's been great. We've really uh, dug deep, I yeah. think. It's nice to catch you up. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Uh, Safe journey home. All righty. Thanks very much. See you soon.